Today, I'm speaking with Brandon. Brandon, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah. Hi, Tim. How you doing? Good. Very good. I'm so glad to speak with you. And Brandon is a fellow YouTuber, so it's always a privilege to talk to someone else who's kind of doing some similar things to, to this platform. And I don't know too much about Brandon. Uh, as, as I say, many times people would just kind of get to know you together with the audience. But Brandon lives in the Midwest, and he works in the ad tech field. Uh, he's been married for 13 years, and he has two young children. He has a lot of passions and hobbies, such as philosophy, theology, reading, writing, and photography. And his goal with his YouTube channel uh, is to help others who, like him, uh, are trying to uh, you know think through these deep issues. And his YouTube channel is called MindShift, and the link will be beneath our video. Please go like and subscribe and check out his great content there. And besides that, Brandon, what else can we know about you? Yeah, appreciate that. I'm excited to be here. Um, yeah, those are the, most of the hobbies. But like I said, I'm just interested in everything. So if I can get my hands on something, you know, reading does that for you. It allows you just to discover a, a brand new hobby or passion or interest. Right now, I'm really into reading a lot about uh, the brain. Uh, just fascinating to understand the neuroscience and then down to the psychology. Uh, and the only other hobby that I didn't mention is I'm big into endurance uh, sports. I do a lot of ultra running and ultra cycling. doesn't look like it right now. I'm injured and I've puffed up, but uh, typically that's a huge part of my life as well. So I'm surprised I I left it out. Hmm. That's awesome. That's awesome. What do you have uh, like a marathon in mind for some, or something you're doing soon? Are you, you going to go big with Ironman and... So I can't away. swim. <laughs> I can't, can't swim. swim. Okay. No. So I do duathlons a lot, um, gravel racing, and then the the ultra running. The last one where I got injured, I was on my my first attempt at a hundred miler, and I made it to sixty five, um, and my Achilles freaked out. So that was about a year ago. It's a long recovery. Um, I hope to try in about a year and a half for another hundred miler. It takes a while to ramp back up for it. So that's that's the big goal. Before I die, I've got to find a way to to do a hundred miler run. Mm, that's awesome. You're putting me to shame here. I need I need to get in that same groove. <laughs> Well, um, I'm so glad we're here to uh, hear your story to chat with you about your, your kind of your journey. So I'd love to kind of take it back to the earliest days of kind of where your exposure to Christianity started from. Yeah, man, for sure. Uh, where to start? So many, so many options. So I was born in the mission field. I was born down in Guatemala. My parents were medical missionaries in the 80s uh, up in Shela and some mountain spots reaching out to the Mayan people of Guatemala um, at the time that they're in the middle oh. of a civil war. So pretty intense times down there. Uh, really interesting, especially for my older sister, who was a bit older than I was uh, by the time we moved back. Um, but we moved back because my parents actually ended up um, getting divorced, which is, you know, pretty interesting. The The context here is that my dad would kind of have backslidden and my mom was ever more fundamentalist and uh, coming back and getting involved in the church. So really split childhood there in terms of these dichotomies in my life and different belief systems, um, which plays a lot, I think, maybe something I'm still exploring actually into 30 years later, what happened with my deconversion, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the the exposure, just to give you an idea of the kind of family I was born into and the, the situation when we moved back, my mom got immediately involved at a church as their missions director. So being in charge of leading missions trips and uh, and I was at the church 24 seven. She was there all the time as an actual pastor uh, in the missions sense and uh, Saturday, Sundays, Wednesdays, Mondays, prayer groups, you know, worship nights, et cetera, uh, not to mention all the small groups. I mean, I don't think there was one day in the first 15 years of my life that I didn't have something church related to some extent, or at least, you know, at her house with uh, a group of worshipers or, or whatever the case might be. With that background, did you have kind of a subconscious expectation that like if you didn't go into missions you were kind of not either you know fulfilling the best life possible or following in their footsteps like was there that pressure or did you or either by them or just by yourself it's an interesting question i i don't know you know for as much as as my mom i mean her her whole thing like she would criticize pastors for preaching just the gospel and not the great commission right like the whole point of our existence is to go and tell other people and reach the unreached you know i did a i did a fourth grade talent show my presentation was on the 1040 window are you familiar with that term yeah very much yeah yeah, so the 1040 window being the the section of the most unreached people by latitude and longitude. So that's, you know, that's what I'm doing as like a child for my talent shows instead of like a dunk contest or whatever. Uh, so with that, I never really, there's always that nagging doubt, you know, even as I was getting older, like, am I supposed to be in the ministry? Am I called? Um, 
my mom, surprisingly, it's the one thing maybe she didn't push on me too much. Uh, she did get me involved very early in something called JBQ, Junior Bible Quiz. It's kind of a evangelical phenomenon in the 90s. I think maybe it's still going. Uh, and they had this big stat of how many kids that went through this program ended up in the ministry. And so I think like, yes, she definitely was doing things to try to help me get into that mindset, but uh, never like, hey, you're going to grow up and be a pastor. Never this pressure. I probably put more pressure on myself inwardly of should I be doing this? Am I called? Or, you know, we had so many, I think it's because I was around so many missionaries that were doing fundraising that we always heard about the need to go and be able to make money. The people that could support the church, there were doers, there were prayers, and there were financial supporters, right? Something to this extent. And so it wasn't like, what do I want to do? It was which of these branches am I going to be most utilized in uh, and most successful in, in yeah. helping the end goal. Um, so frontline ministry never had to be anything. Gotcha. It's interesting too, the, the pressure in that context of, and it might be subconscious for some people, but it was very, very much in my the forefront of my thinking of like, like, what else would you want to do with your life besides, in, if you can, directly go? And uh, that passage in Isaiah 6, you know, who will go for us here, my Lord send me. Like, to me, that wasn't, it was kind of like weird to me how I didn't see people just kind of shouting, saying, please, please, I want to go. And I was mm. like, dude. And I wasn't trying to be judgmental, but I, there was probably an element of like, like, why aren't more of you signing up? If you really believe this stuff, like we should all be kind of charging the the gates of hell, as it were, like we're here to make a difference. And these people are going into hell without Christ. Like what, what possibly could you, like, you really want to go be an electrician? You really want to go be a, you know, janitor? Like, are you kidding me? Like what, it doesn't matter if you make a lot of money or a little money. It doesn't matter what your career is. You need to be doing everything you can to get the gospel. And of course that was put in the paradigm as often of like, go where the people don't have access yet. Like if, if, if there's like, you got a Bible, oh, you got like a hundred versions, you got a thousand translations. Don't go there. They're saturated. Go where they have nothing. And so that was like, in our culture, it was like, that's the best best life is go where they don't have an option yet. Mm -hmm. They have, they don't know it. They don't know the name of Jesus. And uh, that pressure was just, I couldn't get it. I couldn't get why people weren't just saying, please let me go. Yeah. No, it's, it's interesting that kind of, I don't know if it's a cognitive dissonance or, or what it is in the mind of the believer, but that was something that bothered me a lot as a child, is it seemed like people were really down the middle a lot. Like, oh, I'm going to be a missionary right here in my city where, you know, God has put me here. And it always felt like a cop out to me that people were just making an excuse for the life they wanted to live. Very judgmental coming from me. Um, and a lot of that was, of course, you know, my mom just judging people who went to the simple Tijuana mission trip instead of going to, you know, Nepal or whatever. And, um, and I just remember thinking like, if this is indeed true, if this God is indeed who he says he is, and the book is correct, and this is the Great Commission, yet alone anything else. Like, why are we all not fighting with demons every day and like raising money to go on the next trip and not storing up for ourselves treasures here? Like, we shouldn't worry about the 401k. Like, we should, you know, it's all about tomorrow. It's all about heaven. And so it's destructive. It's a horrible thing as I've deconstructed to understand how much that robs you of the one precious life we have here. But at the time, it was just so confusing as a child to see people that professed a belief and then did not go 100%. And that's the bad name of fundamentalism. Um, and as I've deconverted, I went through a process into more progressive Christianity and things of that nature. But from my perspective now as like an agnostic atheist, I think is what I'd kind of consider myself, seeing all of the progressives say, you know, the fundamentalists just have it crazy. They're they're making a bad name for us. They're they're reading too into it. They're too literal. It's like if it were true, that seems to me the best representation of religion. It, you know, the the most extreme, the possible, um, because the Bible was extreme and what God asked for was extreme. And so I don't know. It's something that's always really bothered me, both when I was in it and now that I'm out of it. Yeah, I agree. The progressive Christianity route has always baffled my mind too, and. I know that a lot of it is just predicated on them reinterpreting things, saying, oh, you all had the wrong interpretation or so-and-so, you know, 500 years ago said this is the way to interpret this. But, you know, when you look at early Christians, they probably saw it differently. So a lot of reinterpretation of stuff, everything from hell to, you know, women being pastors. But you're right. At the end of the day, like, if this is real, and there, I mean, even if there wasn't a hell, like, if there's a God who designed you 
then the best thing you need to do is to figure out your design because you're otherwise just kind of wasting your life, even if there's not hell, you know, that you're going to uh, end up in because, you know, he obviously designed you with a very specific purpose in mind. So you you need to know that purpose and know him. And yeah, I, I definitely don't get that, that, um, that perspective. It's, it's, uh, it seems like for a lot of people, that's like the last train stop before agnostic atheism, but they just, some people, it's just, they just have to stop there. It's just, it's too much to go all the way right away. Yeah, I can see that for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I mean, I almost got stuck there. If a few things hadn't happened differently, who knows, right? Um, it's, it's very interesting to think about the, you know, free will and verse determinism of like how I was one of the ones lucky to get out, et cetera. I mean, there's just, there's a lot going on there, but we, we can get back to the childhood stuff. Yeah. What, what, what age did, I don't know if you said this before and I missed it, but at what age did you actually make an official proclamation of your faith in Christ? Yeah, it seems like the first memory I have is kind of being in my sister's room, and I would have been so young, like four or five, um, saying the prayer with my mom, you know, the traditional sinner's prayer, asking Jesus into my heart to be my personal Lord and Savior, all of the religious keywords that we're so familiar with. Um, it wasn't the last time I did it, you know, looking for assurance throughout my entire childhood, every altar call. Um, every personal moment of fear or thinking that a demon is in the room with me and that this is something because I've fallen away, et cetera. Just, I would, I would say that a lot of my childhood was wrapped up in that, am I truly saved? And the guilt of sin with trying to just make sure that I am in the best possible position to actually be saved. That if I die in my sleep tonight, I'm actually going to go to heaven, um, that I'm not deceived, that there's not something else going on here or you know, oh, I'm just now old enough to understand this. Now is the age of accountability. It wasn't when I was seven and I redid it. I'm nine now. Now I get it. You know, and just this moving goalpost uh, based off hearing this sermon or reading this devotion of trying to understand what was true, where I'm at. But yeah, it was probably four or five when I said it for the first time. Mm -hmm. Did you, you know, with, with the traditional uh, response we all have, like you're saying of rededicating your life to make sure it's real. Was there a point at which you kind of graduated from that dynamic and where you just were like, I am absolutely one of God's children. I'm in the kingdom. My, you know, my, my absolute faith is in Christ alone and I am not trusting my own works. I'm trusting Christ's righteousness alone for my salvation, his death and resurrection. And I'm, you know, I'm sealed. I'm sealed to the day of redemption. Was there a point at which that, that peace kind of settled that you don't have to keep trying to figure out if you're really saved? There were definitely inferences where I started to believe that that was more the case that just, you know, there's so many contradicting scriptures that tell you if you can know you're saved or if you're being deceived or once saved, always saved, or if it's sealed or not and what that means. And, you know, as I would go through different understandings of theology, I would have different interpretations of what I thought salvation meant, or if we could lose it or how much works came into it, et cetera. Um, so it wasn't actually until much later, like early 20s, I married where my wife and I kind of got on the same page of free grace salvation that it is I'm grafted in, um, you know, the analogy that we got from this one book, and I, for, I forget the name of the book, but it was, you know, if you're a child and you got adopted, not even adopted, you know, if you're born to two parents, it doesn't matter if you break relationship with them. It doesn't matter if they hate you. It doesn't matter if you hate them. Nothing will change the fact that you are indeed their child, period. This is a given. And that was the analogy used that once you have professed faith in Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you're grafted in, you have become a child of God, and whatever happens forward from that point, your actions, your works, your backsliding, whatever, uh, it doesn't matter. You're you're truly a child and, and it's gone. And so that was probably like, yeah, it, it took until the 20s for me to like get that. And it took that particular theology for me to not rely so much on my own works and deeds to to feel saved or to feel connected or how much is the Holy Spirit working in me? What is the witness saying to me, et cetera? Um, and it's just, it's, it's just funny that with all the knowledge I had and all the time I spent in the Bible, and I still don't know, like if, if, if the God, if God showed up and he said, I am real, guess which salvation is right. I still wouldn't really know exactly like what to point to, um, because it's all been so convoluted at this point to me, but yeah, it, it took a couple decades. Hmm. It's interesting that analogy you mentioned about being born from a Calvinistic perspective, which is where I landed before my deconversion, mm. it, you would add to it the idea that not only are you born, therefore you're definitely a child of, of your parents, you're a child of God. But you didn't have any choice in the matter of whether mm. or not you were born. Like 
your being born was completely the will of your parents and you're being born again, you know, by in, into a, a, a spot of being at peace with God was by God's volition, not yours. Or the other one that we got a lot was, you know, you're not, you're not drowning in your sin. You know, please don't think of this as you're drowning and trying to get out of your sin. You're the corpse at the bottom of the ocean. You're dead and decaying. You don't need someone to pull you out of your drowning of sin. You need someone to give you new life. And of mm. course, a, a corpse doesn't ask for new life. A corpse is just going to be dead and do nothing. And so you got this real strong sense in the groups I was with of like, this is def- you're you're secure because if you are showing any evidence, any fruit, like you want to know the Lord Jesus and you honor the cross and his death and resurrection, you honor the salvation he's purchased for you, then that's evidence that God has truly given you a previous corpse, spiritually new life. So all glory to him, you know, he gets all the glory because he did it. And therefore, you know, it's not in your hands to undo it because you didn't start it and you won't finish it. And that was, that was an interesting kind of, you know, series of, of illustrations to me that kind of gave me that piece of like, okay, stop trying. You know, as long as you know that you want, you want this, this is truly the spirit working in you. And I, you know, I saw my, my passion was just to share the gospel nonstop and to know the Lord better and to have a better prayer life. So I was like, the fruit's there. But secure, you know, be secure, rest in this. You don't have to work for your salvation. God did it. It's done. And that I definitely felt like I loved being at that spot of like, okay, this the, the anxiety of your salvation is over. You are safe and secure. Yeah. And I, you know, Calvinism has pros and cons in that regard, right? Because the the pro of it is the security um, cause it's out of your hands. And then the con of it is, well, then predestination is true and, you know, issues with free will. And I think that's what sure. kept me quite often from being able to fully commit to that side is I could not reconcile the clear descriptions of predestination or even just thinking about it logically, like, you know, God's omniscience and choosing to create this, this is by definition, robbing individuals of their free will you know, no one signed a contract to be born into this earth. Right. And so I think like at some point you have to get to grips with that, but I put it off for a very long time. And, uh, and there were moments, you know, I, I say it got to the twenties, but there were moments where it's like, yeah, this is it. This time I'm really saved. I'm really living for the Lord. I'm really doing it. I'm secured. I heard the right verse, you know, whatever. Um, and, and there would be good chunks of time where, you know, I was able to hold on to that till the next different kind of pastor from the other kind of church that we were visiting said X. And I was like, well, what is true? So just confusion, but mm. yeah. You mentioned Bible quizzing. Could you tell us a little bit more about just your relationship with the Bible and both in terms of, you know, academically maybe, or, or, or school-wise, you know, memorizing and hearing sermons, but also just your private uh, relationship with the, with the Lord through the Bible? Yeah. I mean, you know, as a Christian, nothing more should matter, right? It shouldn't be about the theologians. It shouldn't be about the catechisms. When I, I'll get to your question, but when I first started dating my wife, she came from a pretty traditional Lutheran background and she started showing me things from the catechism. And I was like, what are you, what are you doing? How does this matter? Like we have the Bible. And so just to give you an idea of like my, my concept of the importance of it. Um, so JBQ, I started very young first grade, uh, and I did it through, you age out at some point. I think it was maybe eighth grade. Uh, and you know, my team, we were very good. Uh, we went to nationals every year. We won like five of those years in Chicago. Uh, I was one of the first people, uh, in the Midwest to get their word master, which is like the equivalency of an Eagle scout, uh, for, for the boy scouts. It was, you know, a, a decade worth of work, uh, and memorization and you had to know it in multiple translations. So I was studying it in KGV, ESV and NIV, um, and we'd have to answer different questions in different verses, et cetera. And so it really just gave you a very well-rounded understanding. Um, that was, you know, two hours of study a day just for the JBQ. I mean, it's it's funny, those parents that like force their kids into sports really early and you see them out in the yard just berating them. Like that was me alone in my room with my JBQ quiz notes, right? So um, it was it was intense. And that was, that was the JBQ side. That wasn't even just like my personal study time, my devotions, which even as a very young child, I was doing family devotions with my mother and sister. And, um, and then, you know, I went to a Christian school, preschool through eighth grade, uh, and then a public high school and then a Christian college. And so, you know, of course, so many things through the school, especially in elementary school, when they are just beating songs and verses into you. And really what looks back now, even though it was a sweet time in my life and I was with the same 70 kids for like 10 years, which was awesome. I'm still friends with so many of them. Um, there's definitely pros to that religious community aspect that they've got down really good. 
but um, just sheer indoctrination. So that was that was my experience. And then in college, um, I went to a, a Bible school. I went back as a as an older adult. I think I was like 23 when I went back to get my degree. I just started working at 18. Uh, and when I went back, I ended up just getting a Bible major along with my business major. And so, you know, went through all the exegetical studies and theses and uh, and just, you know, really working through the Bible uh, very strongly. Um, so, yeah, it it has been a major part of my life. I feel like I know the particular Protestant canon extremely well. Um, that's a, a large part of what I try to do on my channel is really, you know, let's let's use the Bible to talk about this because the Bible is what created all the issues in my life. And the Bible is also what allowed me to deconvert, um, which I think is a pretty common sentiment amongst us atheists, right? Like if you really read the Bible and you really look and you're honest and and you're willing um, to take the lenses off sometimes, you're going to see the vast issues uh, here. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I think that's one of the things that breaks my heart the most is is seeing people, you know, loved ones in our families that just don't don't and won't and can't. Um, and you just you just shake your head and you're like, especially the people that are that are into the full inerrancy, like there are no issues anywhere, and this is an absolutely flawless book. And you just sometimes it just almost takes my breath away thinking about what it takes to. To have and to carry that party line for decades at a time. I mean, I, I kind of took, you know, I had that myself, but I also did not have anybody in my life questioning me for the most part, which is you mm. know, part of the sheltering process is you yeah. don't, you don't surround yourself with people that are going to attack your worldview. You, you surround yourself with people that are going to say your worldview is just fine. And you really don't need to look at the other issues, you know, or other questionings that are occurring from other people because they're, you know, they're atheists, they have their sinful agendas. But just when you are are willing to to do that and to put your your fingers in your ears, it kind of makes sense when there's no one else saying, "Hey, I got a problem." But when when your loved ones, your dear loved ones, your friends, and your family start saying, "Actually, I'm 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 in your inner circle already, and I've I've got a problem," to to shut them out and to shut them down is it's amazing the way it works, and it it breaks my heart daily to see that because you just think. Like you mentioned, you know, escaping, and I, I use that uh, illustration a lot too. I call it Bible prison. You know, I escape Bible prison, but I'm like, you are truly in a prison for your mind, and you don't see it, you won't see it, you can't see it. And if you're if you're not willing to, you could literally go to your deathbed thinking this stuff's all real. And I, I shudder to think about that for myself, but also for my loved ones. It just it's just heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I'm in that boat now and, and I'm sure we'll get to that more. There's plenty still to say about the the upbringing, but, you know, my wife still believes and we're in the middle of issues with how we're raising the children. And uh, my mom obviously still believes. It's interesting now to mm. speak to my dad as well from his perspective of, you know, he played it. First of all, they were divorced and I didn't see him that much. Uh, but when I did, you know, we just never talked about it. The The fact was dad didn't go to church. Mom thought he was going to hell. Uh, you know, we pray for my dad and stepmom, uh, but I never assumed they would be able to believe. I just like, if my, I heard his preaching, my mom played tapes for me and it was phenomenal. Like absolutely some of the best that I'd ever heard. And I've been everywhere. I've heard everything. Like my dad was extremely gifted. Mm. And, uh, so to know like, okay, well, and I think that always played in the back of my mind. Like someone was able to know it that well, whether he was faking it or not, it was the greatest performance of, of life. Uh, and then to just not care anymore, to not, and I, I never, I always assumed he kind of still believed there's a God. And, you know, my dad made one comment one time I really hung on to. He's like, if there is a God, he's drawing circles to keep people in, not to keep people out. And I think that was how he justified to himself that he'd still make it, even though he wasn't living this life anymore. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so he, so, he obviously switched his worldview though significantly. I'm assuming like we've talked about it now. And I think that my sureness now as an adult has like, deconverted my father further. I think he would have been the traditional, like, oh, you just want to be handed over your sin. Like he, he didn't want to go to church anymore. He divorced my mom. You know, he was trying to make a bunch of money. Like it was this just like the perfect atheist to point to, even though I don't think he ever said, I don't believe in God. He just wasn't living the lifestyle anymore. And I was too afraid to talk to him about it. And he was too, uh, probably maybe trying to respect my mother since she was like sole custody of not like turning us against it. I don't know. Um, it'd be interesting for me to continue to talk to him about, but uh, it is, you know, now I'm in the same boat. 
you know, my wife and I haven't divorced, but here I am, the the father in the relationship that doesn't believe. And I've got two young kids, just like he had two young kids, same gender, same ages. And um, it's it's an interesting, from a Christian perspective, it would be the sins of the father, I'm sure. But here it's just like, we share the same DNA and we think the same. And, and we, I'm sure we are bugged by many of the same issues. Mm. I definitely want to get, I was not aware of the details of your uh, being unequally yoked, as they say. Mm. So I definitely want to, when you get to that point in the, in the story, I want to get to that uh, details because yep. that's, that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, yeah. So, well, what, um, in terms of going back to your story, you know, you love in the Bible and the Bible quizzing and being in the word, what was your, just your quiet, private devotional life? Like, what was it like when you were just not trying to memorize more of scripture, but just, just talking to God or, you know, taking a walk in the park and, you know, asking God for his w- will and his wisdom and guidance. Like, what did that feel like? Yeah, it's. Sometimes it's hard to remember because, you know, we've redone, and I'm sure you've done this as well. I think I've heard you say as much in, in certain interviews you've done, like you do this reframing of, okay, well, now I know that wasn't the Holy Spirit. So like, what were the psychological aspects at play, right? And it kind of muddles the memories a little bit, as best as I can tell. I'm I'm pretty sure when I was extremely young, I had just an enormous amount of faith. In fact, I've gone back and read journals even from like high school age where I would write like a list of strengths for myself. Like this was like a a journaling practice that you saw somewhere, you know, a pre whatever page to fill out. And always the number one of everything was my faith and not necessarily like my faith as in how people say like my faith is in their salvation, their connection with God, like literally my faith to believe in impossible things and, and to, you know, have more faith than the average Christian to, to, to really expect God to move and do what he say he says he was going to do. Um, and so I do know that like from looking back at those journals that I was just a believer through and through. I I expected God to do what he said he was going to do. I think a lot of kids like have this doubt kind of like they do with Santa, not me. I was full blown like this is real. This God can do it. That's a demon over there by my bed. God will take care of it. Like just really, really, really um, in that quiet time in my alone time, felt like I was genuinely talking to God. I always had a problem hearing from God. And this is something that that was definitely one of the biggest and all deconversions is this divine hiddenness aspect. But I just assumed that was God testing me or me not having done the right things or God heightening my faith, because if he made it too easy for me, you know, all of the sick justifications um, and arguments that come from even Christian apologists about the people who struggle to hear from God, the sincerity of it. Um, So it bugged me and it also didn't bug me. Like it was definitely an issue and something in the back of my mind, but I excused it pretty good. And if anything, it made me dig in more. Like I've got to earn this. God's going to do big things with me. You know, one of the things that marked my childhood and my personal relationship with Jesus is fourth or fifth grade. I'm not sure which. We had a missionary staying with us, which is par for the course. And uh, at the church service the next day, his name was Marcel, and he, you know, powerful message, raising a ton of money, um, healing people, the whole Shabbat shebang, and then uh, gets to me, you know, calls me up, and this is a church of like 3,000, and prophesies over me uh, this, (laughs) at the time, incredible, now ridiculous and harmful prophecy that others will do works, but you will do signs and wonders. Um, you will literally speak to the land when there's drought and things of this nature. You know, my mom uh, had it recorded and then she had it printed and it was hung up in my bedroom and I journaled about it. And uh, it became like a a major part of both the importance of what I would do for God, which is why like your ministry question earlier, it's like, it, I, I didn't know how it was going to end up, but Like if this is the prophecy and God's real, this is going to happen and I don't have to worry about it. I just need to keep doing the next right Christian thing, right? Was Mm kind of how I viewed it and why I didn't have plans for myself so much. Um, So, but anytime there was an issue, I would, or a question or a doubt or a confusion about a Bible verse or contradiction I was noticing, I would bump it up against that prophecy. Like, well, if I'm going to do this, like either this doesn't matter or there's a good answer for it, or God will show it to me when I need it. Like having that out there, which is the purpose of these things, I think, when you tell kids this stuff is uh, the indoctrination aspect of just keeping their faith up. But yeah, that played a, a monumental role in how I framed Christian issues uh, for the next mm-hmm. 10 years, probably. I can't even imagine like the pressure of of that kind of situation and that kind of prophetic 
environment, it's just, that's overwhelming pressure to, I mean, yes, you can just rest that the Lord's going to bring it to pass, but at the same time, it's like, you know, we expect some pretty amazing things out of this kid. And yeah. well, that's the, the one, I don't have a parallel that's quite to that level, but I definitely, I gave myself the early, early on. I just not even gave myself. I just, I just had the drive to do missions. Like as an eight-year-old boy, I would hear stories of missionaries like Hudson Taylor. And I would just think that's <laughs> it. That's, that's the best life right there. I want to be the next Hudson Taylor. And when I, years later, when I was doing a, an internship at my church, I had a man, an elder uh, ask me, we were just having a, you know, man to man talk for an hour or two after church one night. And um, he was like, what's God telling you? And I, I was very much raised in this sense, like you don't get private messages from God. Mm -hmm. Your messages are from the word. If God's speaking to you, it's through his word and your, your accurate interpretation of it. And so I was like, well, you mean like, what am I reading in the Bible? He's like, no, 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 no. What is God saying to you? And we we went back and forth because I was like trying to clarify because I didn't think he was going where he was going with it, but he was. He was like, what is God saying to you that he's not saying to anybody else? Which I would have seen at that time as like a little bit too Pentecostalist or charismatic for my liking. But he at the end was like, wait a second, you're going to be a pastor and you don't hear God speaking to you? Like you personally? And it kind of freaked me out. And it's kind of the opposite of yours where like, you know, you, you they were expecting God to be absolutely on blast for you. This guy was kind of expecting it. And I was kind of showing up, you know, small saying, I, I'm sorry to disappoint, but God's not talking to me. And it became, that became a big issue for me. It was like, why isn't God talking to me? Is he talking to, to the other elders? Is he talking to the other people in this church? Because I don't hear his voice. I've never heard his voice. I've never heard him even guiding per se. I, I mean, I, I would feel like, looking back on stuff, I would say he clearly opened that. Like I prayed about it, God, what is your mm -hmm. will? And he clearly opened that door. And um, little did I know that often many of those doors that I was sure he'd opened, it would just slam shut. And I was like, okay, what is God's will now? But I remember thinking God's directing, but not like actually talking to me. Did you feel like he was actively talking to you at all? Or did you feel like you needed to pursue hearing his voice more? Yeah, I struggled a lot again with that divine hiddenness aspect because the the expectation was I should be hearing from him. You know, the way that my friends spoke and yeah. everyone at church. So I went to like a an assemblies of God, non-denominational, like dancing in the aisles, everyone speaking in tongues incorrectly. No one's there to interpret the tongues. Like I remember when I read that first, I was like, what is going on? So many little, you know, little things that come in and then you just immediately dismiss them for years. You just put them on hold. Um, and yeah, so it was Very an nice intense time. situation of always wondering like, is everyone else faking it? Or is everyone else got something I don't? Or is everyone else just deceived by the devil, which was more likely than them faking it to me. Right. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I would maybe psych myself into thinking I heard, I definitely would feel the presence of the Holy spirit, you know, when the music got just right during worship and the goosebumps happened, I was like, okay, you know, and they would tell you oh, the spirit of the Lord is here. And, you have this raised emotional priming that's going on. Of course, that's that's what it is. So those were easier, but alone by myself, was that God? Was that not? Was that me? Is that the devil? Those four issues, just never being able to really know which one was which was a major source of contention in my young brain um, and, and my old brain all the way through <laughs> until I was free of it all. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's just, there were times where I definitely probably said like, I remember I was going to join the military. Um, at 17 or 18. And I was very certain that I heard from God to do this. Um, and I, looking back now, I can almost see it as, I don't think I was being dishonest or manipulative, but I was getting so much pushback from my parents and from other people that wanted me to do other things that it was an, it was, I found it to be an easy answer. No one questioned after that, you know, it was just, oh, God told him like, okay. You know, even my friend's parents were like, what are you doing? You're going to go get killed. Cause this was like, right. When we were going to war, you know, um, and, uh, and I, I was like, well, God told me. And, and it was like me saying it out loud, which I never did as a child was the first and getting that feedback from like other authority in my life that, oh, okay. I was like, oh, th this is how it works. I get a little feeling. I profess it. Other good mature Christians have no issues with it. Like this feedback loop of, uh, maybe this is how everyone else was doing it. And so there were different iterations of what hearing from God looked like and meant like to me, I think growing up. 
this might be a too, too direct of a question, so you can you know pass if you want to. But were there any as you got older, were there any particular sins or temptations that kind of got you in a sense of like, okay, I'm not finding much victory, you know, uh, you know, whether it's um, just being willing to pursue the Lord in every way, you know, spending enough time, you know, you didn't pray enough today, or, you know, oops, you looked at a girl too long. You should have just looked, you know, she caught your eye, but you should have looked away and you didn't, you were clearly staring for a second. You know, were there any sins that you just like found yourself constantly uh, confessing and saying, you know, God, where are you? You know, show up big in this. I want to be holy and pure and, you know, a vessel that's ready to be honoring to you. Sure. Yeah. You know, the, the friend group I had from both church and the per- particularly like this very nice private school um, that, you know, my dad paid for, not, not my mom, which I was made sure to be aware of from both of them for a very long time was an incredible group of like very healthy families and as healthy as you can be believing some of these things that we believed, but like genuinely kind and generous And these kids all seemed perfect. Like none of them looked at porn. None of them like were having premarital sex. Um, And I guess this is getting a a little older, but even all the way down, you know, I just couldn't believe how good they were. And then like where my mom and I lived, we lived in a a rougher part. And uh, the friends that I had from the like trailer park next door and the cul-de-sac around me were like, I got exposed to some things very, 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 very early, like five and six, like porn, you know, horrible gangster rap lyrics that like blew my mind. Um, kids doing stuff in front of me, you know, nineties was big gang stuff. There was, there was a lot of that. And it like to reconcile that with then like shuttling across town to this private school and the families there. Uh, I always felt a little bit of an imposter in the Christian community because I had seen these things. And then of course these addictions happened, you know, I'm a young male, major issues with porn and things of that nature. Purity culture is telling me that I'm completely ruined at this point and broken, um, you know, issues with how I'm going to be able to, to pair with my wife and soul ties that have been created, et cetera. So, you know, sexual sin is definitely one amongst many issues that caused severe doubt of like, how did this happen? Why did God allow this stuff to come into my life so young? Not understanding like the actual trauma responses and just like biological issues that were going on and blaming it all on the devil then leads to the ability of no actual action to be taken to fix these things or correct these courses because it's just a it's just a shame game. It's just a cycle of I screwed up. Let's pray. Let's go to church. Let's feel better. Let's try harder. Let's will this, you know, to show that I can, you know, be this new creation, et cetera. And then of course it fails and you go through the cycle again. Um, and the more that that cycle happened, and I'm speaking more in high school now, the harder it got for me to justify that, you know, I still always kept thinking back to that prophecy. And it's like, you know, but then I'd share that with someone. They'd be like, no, this is it. If you had been squeaky clean, if you had had an easier life, like how were you going to do great things for God? Like he's allowing you he's, and then it gets into the free will issues. Like, so he's just ruining. And I don't think this now, but I definitely thought it then, like my childhood was ruined, stolen from me with these other things that, you know, this exposure and things, he's just doing this to me so I can be a better voice to help other people. Um, which is what you're told, right? That you're that he will make bad things for good, that he will find a way to use you to redeem, et cetera. And so the Christian excuses, instead of actually just helping or being told that it's normal or anything else that would have been a thousand times better for my young psyche, um, is just disgusting to me at this point. But yeah. Hmm. It's it's interesting that you share all that. I had some strong parallels too. I was exposed to pornography very, very young by a a neighbor. Um, fortunately it wasn't, you know, one of those situations where it was like, they were trying to do anything with me. It was just, it was, it was on their TV and I happened to see it and so forth, but, you know, complete hardcore pornography. And I definitely felt the same way. Like I am, I've been exposed to some stuff that I'm ashamed of. It makes me feel dirty, but I obviously can't get the images out of your head. And, um, I mean, obviously they, they drop in time, but you know, at the, at the, at the time of, you know, when. I was growing up, I could remember a lot of these images and it definitely feels, felt like, you know, God, where were you? Like, why didn't you protect me? And, and yet the sense of like, okay, well now I can understand where sinners are coming from. You know, I didn't mm. necessarily do this on purpose, but you know, I can understand where sinners are coming from better. I can understand the grief. And it also, I think put, put into perspective, this sense of like, you may not have 
been a drug addict, you may not have been, you know, boozer, but you know, you still have things for which you're guilty and for which Christ died. Like this, these sins, these things where you, you are thinking about things you shouldn't, that's why Christ died. Like, do you, do you get it that just because, you know, you, you, even if that stuff hadn't happened, do you understand how, how dirty you feel because you did see those things because you do still think about them? You understand that you are much, much more dirty on the inside, even for everything, because all of your righteousness is like a filthy rag. And it was like, I kind of saw it, I guess, in some ways as like a taste of saying, you need to get a grip on your depravity. Like this makes you feel dirty. You are much dirtier than that. Like you don't, you don't want God to tell people how bad you are. And I would almost like wonder, like, how bad am I? Cause you know, you don't mm. feel that bad. Like, yeah. is my heart really that wicked that it's desperately wicked that everything I ever did to, you know, volunteer work or charity, like it's all truly just of the flesh. And I, I, I think it, what it does in many ways is it, it creates this second guessing where you're constantly trying to reevaluate yourself and say, what's my motivation? Am I doing this in the flesh for works? Am I doing this to just purely be grateful to God? And there's a verse, I forget how it goes, but something about, you know, Lord, please, uh, you know, rescue me from presumptuous sins. And I'd always ask like, God, what are the presumptuous sins in my heart and the hidden sins? And I think it, it's really weird, but it, it creates, how, what's the right word? It creates a spiritual psychological OCD where you're just constantly evaluating yourself to say, number one, of course, the big picture, am, am I really a Christian? Am I really in the faith? But number two, am I really, truly constantly keeping my eyes on the prize, on the Lord, on the gospel, on heaven, on eternity, on my, my heavenly father, um, on my salvation? Is my focus there? And it's like, you know, the Peter you know, with the sinking in the water, it's like the minute that you get your eyes off Christ, you are going to sink. Therefore, if you're feeling guilty, it's it's God reminding you, you are not focused on me like you should be. And every time I'd have a bad day or something is like, why can I not have the joy of the Lord today? Or why, you know, why am I struggling with that particular sin? And, you know, of course, it's never the Lord that's the fault. It's always us. Right. We're, we're always the one that's the problem. Yeah. No, I, I hear all of that. And the, the, the Peter, you know, you, you get these Christian ideas that help you that, you know, this is going to be the thing you lean on. So the, the Peter one, like, okay, it was me. I took my eyes off. Now I'm drowning. God's, God's not doing anything. I did this to myself. Like he, he has all the necessary resources, you know, faith, which is what Peter needed to be able to walk on the water. And when you're drowning, when you're sinking, I mean, it's a perfect analogy to just make to give God the greatest excuse ever. You know, then the other one for me that came in a lot to play was Paul's thorn in the side, which is just yes, so ridiculous for many reasons, but it's like, okay, the sexual sin is going to be my thorn in the side. And you know, this, you know, look, Paul was still the greatest of missionaries. He still did the greatest of, of works and he had something he was dealing with. And, um, you know, people had even alluded to me that maybe it was a sexual sin, maybe it was homosexuality, which is why he doth protest too much. Right. And all of these other things. And so it was just this, uh, you know, you get these excuses that start working for you. Like, okay, God, God has a plan, uh, allowed me to go through this for a reason. I'm going to be more powerful because of it for the kingdom. And uh, just a way to rationalize everything, which is the name of the game, I think, for all of religion. It's finding a way to just rationalize life and every experience and every thought into one particular ideology. And it's just, it's so ridiculous. Mm. Quick, quick aside, and this is a bit of a, of a rabbit trail, but I, just, I wanted to share a thought and ask your, your, for your thoughts on it too. How did you deal with the idea, not of, uh, you know, trying to fight porn. I think all Christians would agree to, that they need to fight porn, but just dealing with the idea of seeing the body as good. Like, mm -hmm. for example, I went to to Bob Jones for a year, and they have a huge art gallery. Um, at the time, it was second in value for for Western religious art. It was second in value in the whole world, only to the Vatican. I don't know if that's still true or not, but it was at that time. And I got to work there. I was guarding Rembrandt's and all these Baroque paintings, beautiful. And there was this one gallery I got assigned to this one time, and it had a bunch of, of women who were topless in the paintings. And of course, you know, knowing that the Lord's watching and knowing that there's cameras everywhere, I'm not going to st stare at these paintings, but you're going to walk by them because, you know, I'm pacing back and forth for four to six hours as the, as the art gallery guard for that section of that wing. So you're going to see these paintings of, of the, you know, very, very old paintings, but paintings of topless women. 
And I did ask the curator at one point, like, how does Bob Jones University defend that? Because isn't that kind of pornography? Do you want young, you know, 18-year-old men coming in this gallery seeing topless women? And the, the curator at the time utterly defended it, said, this is part of the beauty of the body. God gave these artists this great ability. This is not pornography. And that really surprised me at the time. I was, I guess, much more conservative than Bob Jones, which is a scary thing to say. Right. But, um, I, you know, I accepted it as it was. You know, I was, I was willing to be to be uh, humble and taught what, you know, another perspective. But it started this trail of thoughts of like, well, how, at what point do you just look at the body and say, this is beautiful? Like, is it possible for a man to look at a woman's naked body and just think she's just lovely? She's just a beautiful creation and to not have it be a sexual thing. And I went back and forth many times where I, I thought at times like that's actually the ideal is to be able to see the, the beauty of the body and to just stop there, not saying I wish I was sexually active with that person, but just to say that body is beautiful. And to say, if we were in Eden still, we'd all still be naked. And that has to so that obviously it's OK, because that's where we all started from it, by God's design. How did you deal with? trying to both fight pornography, but also see the body, both women's bodies, but also, you know, your own body, your own sexuality as a good thing and, and something to be praised and, and joyful, especially in light of knowing that down the line, you might eventually get married and enjoy it there. Like, how did you process all that? Yeah, it's it's an interesting topic in general, I think, to talk about the Christian view of sex pre and post marriage, uh, and then adding in the iterations of what were the experiences they had pre and post marriages. Uh, pre and post marriage that would mesh all this together. I mean, to give you an example, I had uh, I had a friend. He was a pastor's son, and then I'll answer your question. And he had not gone all the way. Right, these distinctions are so important when you're a Christian and you do mess up. Uh, he and his wife had both done things, uh, and they were the first in our friend group to get married. Uh, they had both done things together and with other people before marriage, and the shame and the guilt was tantamount to the point that when they would have sex as a married couple, she would have to pray through the whole thing because she felt so ashamed and, and guilty. And, and so I'm very aware and in touch. Mm. And I've had my own things and, and you know, my relationships, et cetera, with the, the psychological effects of purity culture, um, which was really hot, I think, for our generation. I'm assuming we're close to the same generation. And yeah, I don't know if I was even looking to reconcile it when I was younger. It was you know, my mom had her hangups with my dad and the divorce and things of that nature. And the kind of church I went to and the, the groups I was involved in, in the young men's group and the, the school, all of it had the exact same sexual sin is the greatest sin, which is so funny because it's in direct contradiction to, you know, all sins are equal and, and sin is sin and sin keeps you away from God. And But everyone wants to make a special exception for sexual sin. And that really messed with me because it's like, I don't do drugs. I don't swear. I never once... I still haven't just because it's so baked into me have said the Lord's name in vain. Like I was so good about so many other things, but so bad about that thing that, and that's the worst thing that it was just like, man, you know, who knows what marriage will be like? Who knows if I'm going to be able to work this out? Maybe I'm going to have to go the Paul route, but no, I'm burning with lust. I need to get married. I should probably get married younger. And, you know, all of these, that those were my questions at the time, not so much of, you know, what is God's intention and design with the the human body and and sex as a as a participatory act that is beautiful. That stuff that definitely I had to kind of work out on my own once I was married and figuring out like, you know, my wife and I's relationship. But at the time it was just so absorbed in the shame of it that no, there couldn't be anything uh beautiful there, at least not until until marriage. So it was just a matter of suppressing that long enough to get married and hopefully end the sin. And yeah. Um, that's that would be my answer for you. Hmm. It's amazing too. I don't know if you had this, but there was kind of an unwritten dynamic going on in a lot of the conversations I've had, and I th these kind of conversations came up quite a bit in Bible college. I, I finished up my time at Lancaster Bible College in Pennsylvania, but the idea that you should get married if you're burning, because it clearly says it's better to marry than to burn. So therefore, you you know, if you have this strong sex drive, you know, pers you know, ask God to provide. But you know, if He does provide, you know do it, you know, don't have a two year uh, engagement period, like go get married and have, you know, have a delightful marriage together. But there was this underlying dynamic of, of you shouldn't be so sexually minded. 
because mm-hmm. that was kind of equated with like, even if you weren't looking at pornography, it was like a pornographic mindset. So you're, you're not really mature enough to be married if you want sex too much, but at the same time, because you want sex so much, you should get married. And I think for a lot of people, it just creates this dissonance where you just, you feel like you're set up to fail. Like you want to look and you want to be sexually active, but the fact that you're thinking about it so much is evidence that you're, I mean, I think some of them would have said you're, 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 you're looking at your future wife uh, as a piece of meat, as someone to just, you know, you just someone to satisfy your sexual desires and that you should only see her as like a, as a daughter of the King, as a, as a co-heir of Christ. And that if you're seeing her as, as someone you're too sexually interested in at first, that therefore it's evidence, number one, you don't really love her because if you loved her, you wouldn't see her sexuality. You'd see her. Yeah. And I think people were just all over the place trying to figure out how do I just admit I just want sex and I want to look at women. I want to be okay with that. And I want sex. And people would, honestly, I think they got into this situation where they just felt like they were so guilty that it creates this double world where you're like, you've got the public world of all of us. And it was a lot of us, you know, young men training to be pastors, young pastors, wanting desperately to be seen as godly and, and great preachers and, and, you know, deep theologians and, you know, reading our, our Puritan works, reading Spurgeon, uh, reading our theological books, uh, reading the systematic theologies, learning to be pastors and, and feeling like if we're going to do this, we need to be good, godly, mature men, but knowing deep down inside, and I, I say this not just from my experience, but also from <laughs> endless conversation in, in the guy's dorm with these, you know, pastoral uh, students, that they were feeling constantly defeated. I mean, a hundred percent of the time defeated with this issue of sexuality, wanting it so much, masturbating, and then feeling like they were like if if everyone knew that they were masturbating, they would effectively be disqualified from ministry and yeah. just just overwhelmed with the guilt of that. Yeah, it's absolutely insane to to suppress our most fundamental, other than maybe hunger, biological instance. And turn it into not just something bad, but the worst, the most evil, a disqualifier for having a voice in ministry, et cetera, especially at a time when everyone is pubescent. Like it's the absolute most ironic and oxymoronic issue I can think of. And of course, you know, the church, specifically Christianity, is so hung up on it. It's, um, it's no doubt. And and it leads, I think, in a lot of cases to much worse things. Obviously, it leads, you know, the, I've talked about this on my channel. There's verses, of course, uh, you know, if you've looked with lust, you've already committed adultery. How many people mm-hmm. then are just like, well, I've already committed adultery. I might as well reap the benefit. And I, I know that firsthand from the men's groups I was in and hearing people who had affairs and things of this nature that it's all the same. Like I've already screwed up. You know, if you really believe the word, you really believe that. Um, and so I think that as opposed to a healthy conversation with a young man about, you know, and I'm not Mr. Like porn defender now either. I think age appropriateness and and getting that's like, it's not natural for us to be able to see those many images that like, there's a lot of real harm and people that, you know, from an atheist or secular society don't think that just need to look at the, the data. The studies are, are very obvious with what it does to you, your marriage, et cetera. So I'm still a believer that that's not good uh, in most situations to say the least. And just knowing that uh, there's healthier ways that those conversations could have been had. Like, of course, you're curious. Of course, you're interested. Your body's made to do this. Here's the right and and here's the, not even right, here's the more beneficial way to think about this and how you might want to engage with this and and what statistically this could lead to. Like, if someone had talked to me like that, I'm not saying I would have never looked at porn again, but I think, man, the the health the potential for figuring it out and being able to come into a relationship later uh, in a better way, in a better mindset, and a better understanding and, and treating women correctly, as opposed to this horrible juxtaposition between seeing them as meat and then rationalizing that they are not to be seen that way, not because they're wholly independent people who are worthy of our respect, but because they're God's precious little girls, right? Like if you have to get your value for how you see women simply in because they are owned by another man, which is what you see all the time in the the Bible, or because they are creatures or daughters of uh, a deity, like you still aren't seeing them correctly. You're still only doing it out of some admiration for uh, a higher authority figure or, or some other warped rationality. So 
I'm, I get pretty heated on those topics because it's it's not just incorrect. It's absolutely wrong and harmful. And I think it's one of the things that follows people the most uh, who grow up in uh, a Christian aspect, whether they get out of it or not. So, yeah. And I don't want to get too far down this rabbit yeah. trail because I do <laughs> want to get back to this rabbit. Sure. So I have one more thought. Um, one of the things that's amazing to me, now I would have a slightly different perspective on the pornography from you, but I, I don't want to um, sure. debate you on that day. But one of the fascinating things is that this is going to be more like a little bit of a snarky perspective. So pardon, pardon it if, if it comes through too much to not snark to you, but snark to Christians. Um, when you look at people's perspectives on pornography, one of the things that they say is really bad about it is it creates a fantasy world. You're fantasizing about, you know, maybe, you know, some perfect woman who doesn't have flaws, who's not tired, doesn't have wrinkles, whatever. And you need to be able to enjoy your spouse as they are, you know, with, with, uh, you know, love handles and wrinkles and tired and bad breath and all that, you know, you, you need to be real. This is a real human who's living a real life. They're not going to be airbrushed. So stop stop thinking fantasy is helpful. It's not. It makes you not, it makes you dislike the real stuff, which is stupid. You should love the real stuff. But in that context, if their main argument is fantasy kills, I'm like, okay, do you all not see the irony? For sure. We're, we're talking about one sliver of reality, which is sex. So fantasy in, in the sex world is a killer your fantasy is on the global perspective, the worldview perspective, everything from the planet Earth to, to death, to the way we do politics, the way we do education, everything about your life is based on a fantasy. Christianity is basically a version metaphorically of pornography or the spiritual aspects. And I'm like, like yes, I can agree with certain parts of, of the fight sure. against um, fantasy and you know to make sure marriages are strong, but it always surprise me that people don't don't connect those dots like of all people who should be fighting fantasies christians like this it it really proves to me that they can't see it like they're oh, they just are can't. so yeah, blinded it's it's a hundred percent um it's not even purposeful hypocrisy. like as much as i'd want to judge them for it and i enjoy the snark right along with you but if they could see that they wouldn't be where they are like yeah it's 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 in the the excuse isn't again, you know, the word of the day, the cognitive dissonance is it's unbelievable how we can hold so many. I mean, I, I very literalist, right? Very fundamentalist for most of my upbringing. Again, I went through a period instead of just jumping straight to deconverting of, okay, Genesis is an allegory. It is a metaphor. Cool. You know, let's move on. Um, but most of my even adult life in that respect, I believed in like the psychological nature of you know, why we are this way, you know, kind of giving reference to some things in natural selection while at the same time maintaining the earth was 6,000 years old, right? Like how on earth does anyone hold these two ideas? Um, and it's like that with everything in, in your example with the fantasy. It's just, it's unbelievable the gymnastics we can do as believers. Yeah, well said. Before we do get into some of the details of your uh, early deconversion, could I ask you a um, final question about, you know, the main aspects of your Christian life? Did you feel compelled to share the gospel? And what was that like with anyone that you did share it with? And how, how broad was your you know, ministry in sharing the gospel? And um, did you lead anybody to Christ uh, in, in doing so? Yeah, um, this is a, a source of contention for my Christian life because I knew nothing mattered more. Um, and growing up, I was pretty darn shy and introverted and very much non-confrontational. And I think a lot of that had to do with my parents and, and other factors that we we don't necessarily need to spend time doing. So, you know, that like street approach of going up to someone and have you heard the gospel? Are you saved? You know, that that I didn't like. And I, I started to develop my own and not my own because there were other iterations of this. I started to convince myself that it was more important to lead by example and let people come to me and ask like, why don't you do that? Why, you know, and, and that was how my witness was going to be. Um, there were definitely times where I felt extremely convicted by that, or like I was doing it wrong, or I'm never going to live up to this prophecy if I can't even go talk to people. And then, um, you know, there were a few instances where I definitely had that. Like, you know, I, I remember one summer I was swimming with my cousin. It was like one of the first times I'd met him and we had a conversation and he didn't really know anything. And I was able to tell him and he seemed like he was getting it. And I was like, oh, that's it. Like, I just saved my first person, right? Like he said the prayer. 
And then it was like a count. Okay. The count is on. And so, you know, that fires you up for a little while. And then it's, you get a really negative reaction from someone else. And you're like, oh man, like I probably, I didn't plant a seed there. I just ruined it for them. Right. Like I've, I've now been the annoying Christian in their life. That's going to make them avoid the next better conversation. And so I really like went back and forth was what is the proper approach to this? And of course, according to the gospels and the commission and what you see the disciples doing, it's go into the town, stay with someone, you know, make them make you food, share the good news with them. And then if they don't accept it, that's on them. You move on to the next town. And that's how the the gospel clearly treated, uh, to me, at least in my interpretation of it, the right way to share it. It's not on you to make them feel good. It's not on you to make them uh, to be a good representation of Christ. You're there to plant the seed. God will do the rest. And so getting into those aspects, I was like, all right, we got to do this different. Um but it went back and forth a lot. I remember a conversation. I had I had two super close best friends and one throughout my entire childhood, just the best of the best friends you could have. Um, still best friends today, though there's some differences now. And we had a conversation when we were like 15, 16. We were in high school. We were both at a public high school, you know, public school for the first time. Lots of opportunities to witness. What is it going to look like to be a Christian in a place where most people aren't Christians or you assume everyone is evil because that's what you were told from private school, right? And, um, and we had a conversation about let's be cool Christians, which it's, it seems silly, but it was like a big deal for us. Like, let's be cool Christians. You know, he did great on the football team. I did great on the basketball team. Uh, we were popular. We had fun. We, we hung out with lots of different groups of people. We went to concerts. Let's show that you can be normal because there were all the other homeschool kids that came in and were preaching in the middle of class and, and things of this that was like, oh, gr like, Let's be the cool Christians. And I really like hung my hat on that for most of high school, which is most of the time that I could have kind of been a witness. And we just thought, you know, we'll live it out. We'll be normal and we'll live it out. And that'll be a great testimony, um, which was probably an excuse for both of us not to have to do the hard work. And then that same friend went to discipleship school at his church, which they had a discipleship school we did not. And this is where things started to question for me a little bit. And I saw him like, they would take them on these exercises. We're going to go downtown to, of course, like who's walking around downtown at 11 p.m. at night, like people that are probably on drugs or homeless or people that are, you know, certain parts of this downtown area. And yeah, you go up to those people and you meet a physical need, which is always what we're told to do first. You bring them a meal, you give them some money, you give them a coffee, whatever. Of course, they're going to listen to you, you know, and and you're getting this positive feedback. It's, and I could see the indoctrination even then of this discipleship school is setting these kids up for positive experiences by having them go to the neediest of people, giving them something to make them listen and then feeling like they did a good job. And again, it just continued to kind of gross me out on what I thought was a really improper approach to the perfect love of the creator of the universe. It should be about personal relationship. I have that. I'll put that on display and people can come to me. So that's really how I convinced myself and and how I how I did that most of my life, which if I were a Christian, I was judging myself now, I would say bad job, but that was that was it for me. Hmm. I hear you that it is such a conundrum. I, I was definitely much more on that more active, like, you know, handing out tracks and and preaching and teaching. But it definitely it's still it still was a conundrum. And it what what bothered me though was was not as much the the question of whether to be vocal, but it was the question of like, well, what happens if you don't actually yourself pray with the person to have salvation? Like you mentioned, the count is on. And, you know, I, I definitely I think in the in the big picture it did lead some people to to the Lord. But I always felt like, you know, if if I'm not actively being able to say, like, I brought, you know, one person this month, like one person a month to the Lord should not be a high number to hit. And there were months where that didn't happen for sure. And it definitely was, a, it was a discouragement where I just felt like depressed, like, like God, if, if you say, and you do that, your word is powerful and it will not come back void. It will accomplish what you want it to do. Then I'm preaching to sinners and your word is powerful. So go transform somebody. Mm, yeah. And I definitely felt like the, the guilt of maybe I was doing something wrong that I couldn't just say all the, you know, and I, I, you could always chalk it up too. Well, you're, you're like, um, what is it? A Paul and Apollos, you know, Apollos is going to plant the seed and, yep. you know, someone else waters. But I felt like you'd, you'd see people, especially pastors and, and evangelists who do the numbers game and say, you know, I led 3000 people to Christ this year or whatever. And you think, I can't really say too much about my numbers. I know they're there, but I don't know specifics. 
and I definitely felt like, God, I, I don't know if I'm being like disobedient in some way, but why can't I just lead people directly to Christ where I know for sure that they're in the kingdom because of me. But anyway, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's like a recurring theme. We keep coming up, come up against of like, you just feel guilty because you're like, no matter what you do, you're not right. And Nothing's I've, enough. Nothing enough. is enough. And, and there's always a way to have done more. And, and I, yeah, I see it as two ways. I see it as like, and, and we don't have to continue with this topic too much longer, but I had a lot of thoughts while you were speaking there. I would have viewed you uh, in in that kind of role of like having a number, a goal as like some kind of a, a Christian narcissism. Like, why are you making this about you? And and those were, yeah. were my thoughts, but they were also self-protective thoughts to make sure I didn't have to go do the more bold, hard thing that you were doing. And both can exist at the same time. And that was that was it for me. Like I would see people like that and I would hear the same pastors. I mean, that's all it ever was. It was, uh, we had a revival last weekend when we had the big 10 up and X amount of people came to the Lord and X amount of people were baptized. And I just, I remember thinking even like as a young person, what, what, what else did you do? Like, how, how are they doing now? Is that person actually healed? We all saw them wave their arm around and it looked like it didn't hurt. And then they said, thank God. But like, are they living for the Lord? Is their arm healed? Like, where's the follow-up? And so I had this real um, self-righteous attitude of everyone else is doing it wrong. And probably that prophecy fed into my, like, I'm going to be the change. This is the right way to do it. Like, stop the numbers game. Stop the narcissism. Have the experience with God yourself. Let other people witness you. And So yeah, it was. it's all the same way, though, of you and I both trying to reach an end goal of feeling like we were doing what we were supposed to be doing and being obedient to the Lord and then not seeing the effect we thought we were going to see and struggling with that outcome. And so, yes, nothing is enough. Just ridiculous. Mm. Yeah. And you, you've always got somebody saying there's a different, better way to see it and yep. do it. And I remember that came out a lot. With, I was part of a Billy Graham crusade in Philadelphia. Mm. And I thought that exact thing when it was over, like, I wonder how many people are just going to go back home and live like they've been living forever versus how many people are actually going to get plugged into their churches and um, anyway, I do want to get back to your story though. What, what were some of the earlier, uh, other earlier seeds that kind of moved you towards questioning things early on, man? I mean, so my, my mom never spent, you know, she spent quiet time with the Lord more than I did. Right. But I felt like she never studied or knew her Bible. She probably was the kind of person who read the same, like 20 verses, meditated on them. There's all the pretty ones, uh, all the ones, you know, new Testament only things of this nature. And so I never had like a solid theological backing from her. Like I think a lot of people do with extremely, it, it's it's kind of gross to me now to think that she could have been up preaching to the church with how little she understood about her Bible uh, that I would gain the understanding through things like JBQ and then all the way up through Bible college. And with that, whenever I had a question, I got a really bad answer. And so she eventually like pushed me off to go talk to the pastors about it. But I questioned a lot. I My very first question was the difference in Genesis between God creating men and women at the same time, and then man and then woman, uh, because you get the different inferences. And, and I understand how Christians have justified that one is just saying he made them and the other is given a specific order. But that was the first time that I was like, wait a second. And I was, I don't know, six or seven. I was very young. And she was like, good question, doesn't matter, not a salvation issue, which would have, if I could say the theme of my young childhood, it was hearing not a salvation issue with every Bible question I ever heard. And uh, and it went on from there. There were other things, you know, like every kid, I had a hard time reconciling that God just always was. I think a lot of kids deal with that, but it, it stuck with me forever. It's like, seriously, what is going on here? How does that make sense? I, I it was It was enough of a bug that it was one of the first things when I started hearing arguments like the Kalam and things of this nature that I was like, oh, other people are trying to answer this and and they're failing. And um, in, in my, in my uh, opinion. And so those early questions and just like, how does God work? Um, and then seeing the hypocrisy in the church, um, seeing what I felt to be very, I'll give you one more example from the church, uh, similar to the Marcel story. We were traveling uh, for my mom to do some speaking tour, and we were at some Southern church, which was <laughs> even more wild than my Midwestern uh, non-denominational church, which I thought was going to be hard to beat. And my sister and I had been fighting in the van, and she pushed me, and I lied. I said that she hurt my wrist uh, just to get her in trouble. Not good. Um, and I think my and you know my mom heard that, and then sure enough, at church service that night, 
they're doing healings. And the pastor's up there, eyes closed in the spirit. And he says, someone here hasn't come up who needs healing. And uh, and he said, it's a, it's a wrist problem. It's a wrist problem. And my sister's looking at me and my mom is just sitting there worshiping. And I'm looking back on it. I think she told him. And I didn't go up because I knew I hadn't actually been hurt, but my mom didn't know that. And it was like this first little tear of, wait a second. Every other time I've seen a pastor do a healing, I believe that it was 100% accurate. No one else is going up for this wrist. My mom, who had dinner with the pastor an hour ago, is the only person that knew about this, but she doesn't know it's not real for me. And it all, like, I think that was fifth or sixth grade. And it was just like this one, it didn't erode everything for me, obviously, but it was enough of like, do people do this? Are people manipulative? Are these healings not true when people fall over? Like, why are they falling over? And so... I started questioning a little bit more of the like super high end fundamentalist stuff. You know, my mother would speak in tongues when she would do the dishes. And then, you know, at that point, I'm really good with my Bible. Like, mom, you're supposed to have an interpreter. What are you, what are you doing? So she would stop speaking in tongues. But it's like, if that wasn't real tongues, because it wasn't blessed by the Lord, because there wasn't someone there to interpret it, but she was doing it. And she really felt like she was doing it. Like someone can have a personal experience or what they believe to be a personal experience with God that definitely isn't. And so if people can have that, I can have that. And if anyone can have that, maybe everyone is having it. And so like a lot of those thoughts started to trickle and I just put them in a closet. Um, It's funny, the two things that have pushed me, and I think this will lead us into kind of the deconversion aspect of it. Right before I married my wife, when we were engaged, I was like, I really got to figure this out. Like we're coming together. She's got a Lutheran background. We have different families. Where are we going to go to church? You know, kind of, we've, I've really, what do I believe in why? And I read a journal entry the other day from, uh, when we were engaged, I was 21 and, um, so many doubts, so many issues just written on this page about, you know, where the Bibles came from, how the canonization process worked. Like I, I'm surprised. I didn't realize that at 18, I was looking at those things and had those questions. And then to see them just sit on a shelf for seven years or or 10 years um, before I would deal with them again. And the next time I dealt with them is when we had our first son. And I felt a responsibility to make sure that I was going to be able to teach him and lead him right in Christ. And so again, like Brandon, get it together. What do you believe and why? And it's like, that's a, maybe let's, let's figure it out. A nine year gap, an eight year gap between when I wrote all those doubts and had all those issues, had completely buried them moved on with my wife, figuring out free grace salvation, you know, helping other people come to the Lord, uh, going on missions trips, going to church, going to small group, having community, having fellowship, et cetera. And then the exact same questions, exact same when I started to like figure out what do I need to talk, figure out before I talk to my, before I, you know, I'm in charge of this other being for God just hadn't been dealt with. It was the most clear realization of how easy it is to just put things aside. And that was the final straw. At that point, I decided like, I can't do this for another decade. I really need to know I'm responsible for my child. And the walls just started crumbling down. I became more open. I saw more atheist YouTube things. I exposed myself to things things that I'd previously uh, purposely uh, made sure that I didn't look at the books that I didn't read. And, um, And yeah, it really fell down from there. But there had been hundreds, maybe thousands of issues and contradictions that I'd clearly noticed that I'd written down, that I had addressed, that I had questioned, that I never got a good answer for throughout my entire childhood that I simply put on a shelf and chose not to deal with, which now, and then I'll I'll shut up here in a second, let you speak. But now I see how, how sincere I still was in my belief and how much I still believe that God was always real. I just don't understand something. Jesus is still here. I'm still feeling his presence. I must just have a wrong inter- interpretation. The devil's messing with me. Like those were all of the answers that allowed me to clearly not deal with the things that I had so clearly noticed. Uh, and it's just like you said at the beginning of the conversation, people obviously do this for their entire life. And when I first watched my first atheist video and heard someone boldly pronouncing, all of the issues with the Bible and things of this nature is like, what a fool, you know, like, how does this guy get off? How on earth does he think he's smarter than the 2 billion people that have believed in the 2000 years of church history and everyone that's thought of these questions before? You're not unique. You're not special. And now I'm doing the same thing, right? But 
I know how stubborn and how much you can really believe despite all of that stuff. And that's what led me to wanting to do the channel and really help other people of breaking through those walls a little better and making people, not making people, encouraging people and influencing them to truly deal with it early before they waste another decade of their life. And um, and so, yeah, that's kind of the the crux, the the meeting point of what led me to fully dealing with the issues. Mm. I'll just jump in to say real quick, it's amazing the impact that children have on us. And I've heard several people do that. It's certainly true in my life. A lot of the things you you don't think about them for whatever reason, um, you know, we can all dig into why, but we don't sometimes address them the way we should. We put them off for another day in some ways, but when the kids come and we're like, we're about to pass this on to them. And whether you would have called it, a do- whether you would have called it indoctrination or not, just we're going to, we're going to, give them our worldview, our best shot at in, instilling in them the, you know, the truths of the word, the truths of Christianity. And the fact that it shakes us up to realize that we're, there's something in us that just cringes and says, I, I don't know that I want to do this. I don't know that I want to give my kids what I was given. And it's, it's crazy how that works. Cause you're like, if it, if it was such a cringe factor, why didn't it hit before now? But I'm glad at least it does hit at some point. You're like, yeah. I can't, I can't do this to kids. And for me, um, there was, I'll just add this real quick. There was one thing that happened um, about the physical side of things, and one thing that was more philosophical. And it was, it's weird that my my wife, who's still a Christian, we actually agreed on this. We were looking when we were having children at the issue of should you circumcise, hmm. and you know, of course, the Bible is is very you know clear that that's part of God's prescription for His people, the, the, is Jews, and that there's a sense in which obviously it happens in our culture anyway. But it's like if if that's what God's best was for His people was to do this, you know, we we should probably do this. And I had already I've been working on a book um, about the way we see the body. It's, it's I never published it, but a book about Christian perspectives on the body. And I had explored this subject of should we really be espousing uh, circumcision? It, it is a, it is genital mutilation. Is it is it appropriate to do? We wouldn't ever let um, ourselves get into you know doing this to a girl to you know the the clitoral circumcision. Should we be doing you know genital mutilation to boys? And you know it's a it's a hard thing because you're like yeah, but God clearly commands it for His people. Is it a good or bad thing? And my wife and I ironically. As both as Christians agreed, we would not circumcise our our boys, which is looking back is kind of surprising that, that we both took that perspective. I'm glad I did though. You know, I'm glad that our both of our boys are are still intact. But that was like a we're kind of bucking the traditional yeah. Christian worldview. We're kind of bucking God's thing. It didn't feel like we were actually disobeying God, but it just felt kind of awkward. Like like I'm not sure how to deal with this elephant in the room, but we're not going to do it that way. You know, we'll figure out why later, but it doesn't feel right to, to do this to our boys. And I'm glad we didn't. But then the other big thing was, as you may have heard in my uh, main presentation on my channel, is, you know, the whole Joshua fought the Battle of Jericho song, realizing we're teaching them genocide. And once I realized that they were old enough to understand that they, they should understand the background of that song, that it includes, you know, genocide, land theft, slavery, um, child brides, you know, slaves that you can beat and stone all these things i'm thinking i'm i'm not sure i want to do that like can i really teach them genocide and, and defending it because you can't just teach them this happened you have to say yahweh clearly commanded his good people and this was a holy act to murder and, and slaughter people including you know babies and, and small children and moms and dads and grandparents this was a holy act by god and as soon as i realized i put put the pieces together even though I'd sung that song for decades, I was like, something's wrong here. I and I didn't at all. I would have never said at that point, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be an atheist, you know, right. watch out. I was just like, something's wrong here. I don't know what to do with this. And that was that was as simple as that. I just I don't know what to do with this. But I just say all that to say in my story, you know, people can watch on my channel, but it's amazing how kids shake you up enough. I'm so glad that they do. I'm so glad that the experience of having children shakes us up to say, is this the best we can do in terms of our legacy. Yeah. I've started to picture it as like a, a hierarchy of belief almost, you know, this was enough. This belief was as real as it got for me. It was enough for me to, to commit my entire life to Jesus, where I worked, I prayed about every decision, who I married, um, you know, 
like literally every decision I put before him. And then the second that I have my son in my life, and it still took me a few years, I didn't con- deconvert until my son was about two and a half. And I started really struggling with it during the pregnancy. So, you know, that was my about three year period of um, severe questioning and and really starting to, to work myself out of the religion. But is there this another echelon of belief that I didn't have where I wasn't willing to just tell my son, same thing. Yeah. We're going to tell you for the rest of your life, slavery is wrong. But in this one instance, when it's or 20 instances, when it's uh, commanded by our loving God, who I'm crying before and praying about how sweet his love is going to be for you. Like the, the so many things broke down in just those thoughts before I even had to have a conversation with him that it was like, did I ever really believe enough? And I've also thought of this like belief hierarchy in another uh, perspective that is think about everyone that does, you know, going back to the porn thing, masturbate and watch porn. But at the same time, they're fully convinced that Jesus is omnipresent in the room with them, seeing them. If a physical Jesus was in the room, you 100% would not have opened up the laptop. 100%. Every single, there's not one that would watch porn and jerk off in front of Jesus. Not one, period. So the fact that so many are willing to do it because he's invisible, but they still believe he's there. I think like there's still that, that level of dissonance or that level of that belief isn't quite strong enough for me to really believe he's here watching me. Like, I don't know. It's something that I've been thinking about a lot lately. And the, and the kids is one example of just showing that something else can become important enough to, to again, um, move you past that first goalpost. Yeah. I, I would say the same thing too. It happened to me with uh, funerals for Christians, realizing there's so much grief at a lot of them, especially if it's like tragic in the sense of this right. person died at exactly. age 20, 21 or 25 or 15. You're like, yeah, but if they're a child of God, going to heaven at age 21 is like, they just got spared old age. They got spared, totally. you know, cancer that might come later. They got spared so much heartache. Um, if they died at age 21 or 25, this is not a tragedy. It's a celebration. And yet the the Christian grief, and I've, I had this in, in, you know, some, some of the circles of my uh, friends and family where, you know, years later, you know, 15 years later, they're still like, oh, this is so horrible. This was so sad. And I'm like, where is the celebration? If they're in heaven, perfect with no tears, then you should be nothing but glad. And knowing that that life is a blink of an eye compared to eternity, yeah, you'll be with you'll be with them in a it's few It's another minutes. perfect example. We yeah. we don't fully enact the belief. I like very very few people would would celebrate their five year old getting bone cancer and having a horrific death and dying just because they're now in heaven. Like who, who does that? There might be some fundamentalist out there that's like, yes, thank God, God took my son. But most people are nowhere near an acting fully that belief system. Yeah. And it, it makes you wonder though, why people don't see that they're really not living it out. And just like you, the example you gave with, um, you know, with masturbation is a good one, but just in, in general, and going back to the gospel again, if you really believe that the people around you are effectively already condemned and headed to a burning hell, like, you know, who who wouldn't walk by a house where you can see it's on fire? Yeah. And there's a there's maybe there's a fire on one side of the house, but it has not spread yet to the other side. But but you can see a kid, a two year old screaming at the window on the house on the side that's clearly not on fire yet. And you just, you know, you do a you know milliseconds worth of calculation, you think. I've probably got at least two or three minutes before that I could go up and save that kid, easily get him back out before either one of us would be in danger of the fire that's spreading. And instead you just walk on by. Oh, there's a fire there. I'm not, I'm not going to do it. You're like, but you know, it would have taken you 15 seconds and you had two or three minutes worth of, of free time to do it with no harm to yourself, save the kid. And you're like, yeah, no, nah, it's, 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 I'm not going to do it. Like if that's what you think is, is, is happening with hell. Why yeah. would you not do everything? And, you know, how can you justify watching four or five, six hours of football on a Sunday when you could be out passing tracks or talking to people or just, you know, even if you're not very vocal like that, just praying, spend those hours instead of watching football, spend them on your knees. But you didn't see that. You'd see people very polished on, you know, in church on Sunday mornings. And then it was just football, football, football. And I think when you realize it makes you wonder, do you really actually believe this? 
Or is this just so culturally part of who you are that you just can't see living a different way? But it's it's like you you don't want to be too serious about it because you're going to be seen as fringe. But it's like, yeah. but but this is ultimate reality. Yeah. As what we said at the very beginning, like the fundamentalist view is as extreme as you can get would be the accurate view if you truly, truly believed. Um, all the excuses in between are just that. They're just excuses. So again, I have a lot more respect for people that you know, even though I think the faith is foolish and harmful, uh, at least if you actually proclaim to believe it and you're out there doing those things instead of wasting your life away as, as the Christian might see it, like at, at least you're consistent. I don't know. Philosophical consistency is like the number one thing I want for people. <laughs> I think it's also the number one thing that gets you out of religion is when you force yourself to be consistent uh, mm. with how you look at the Bible and and, and consistency is just going to win everything. I think, I think that's what it all boils down to, but um, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. I remember Hitchens when he was alive, he would do these debates and he would get frustrated because these progressive Christians would kind of explain things away and try to soften the message. And he came across a pastor, um, a pastor I've spoken about quite a bit, Doug Wilson out in uh, Moscow, Idaho, but Doug Wilson was like, this fundamentalist hardcore is like, yeah, if I was in old Testament times, I would have slaughtered the Amalekites, you know, get the sword out and start slashing. And he was like, Oh, okay. So you really believe this stuff? It's like, yes, of course I do. But it, it was like, he felt fine. Like I can actually talk to someone who really is going to live out what they believe and yeah. so forth. But in terms of that dynamic, though, seeing all these bizarre things, you know, as your all your wheels are turning, you're finally like, wow, like I see it. I see the issues what going now to your situation with your marriage, like how did that, how did you process the threat of like saying, if I tell my loved ones, what's what I'm really thinking, then like, what's going to happen? How did you start to think through all that? Yeah. Um, it was a, 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 thankfully I did it in real time. So, you know, it was a, a slow burn for my wife to realize along with me. And so we'd have conversations about like, this doesn't make sense. And, you know, maybe this is a fundamentalist thing and I'm, I'm leaning more progressive now. And, uh, you know, I'd hear my mom say something horrific, uh, at the dinner table about this legislation that just passed on gay people. And obviously as Christians, like we should have an issue with this, but my mom's divorced. And I was like, so just help me here. And, you know, I would, I would start getting a little more bold. And I, that was one of the examples where my wife first was like, Whoa, are you thinking a little differently? I was like, Jesus says, don't get divorced in the New Testament. You're divorced. But the justification for most of the anti-homosexual stuff is from the Old Testament next to Levitical laws, right next to the things. We're having a pork dinner right now, mom, you know, and you're upset about that. Where's the confusion for you? You're you're preaching tomorrow on Sunday and Paul says women should be silent. Why are you picking that? And then not being consistent with sitting down, shutting up and asking a man to ask your questions for you in church. Like I, I started to just see so much of that disconnect and it didn't mean Jesus wasn't real. It just meant Christians aren't consistent. That's all it meant at first. And so as more and more of that happened and more and more of those issues and situations, my wife started to to hear it. And I'd always comfort her saying, it's not like I'm going to become an atheist. I, I feel so. I must have told her that a million times. It's just that, what about this? What about that? And it got to the point where I realized, and I don't, I, you know, there was a couple different big aha moments of, whoa, shit, I don't think I believe this, you know, and before you're really finally able to tell yourself it's terrifying. And, uh, and at that point I kind of went radio silent on her. I didn't want her to see how far down the, the rabbit hole I went. And I thought I'd probably just live the rest of my life like that. And it just, it, I couldn't do it. I was not you know, I never even thought being true to yourself meant that much because everything else was about Jesus. But now that I didn't have Jesus, it's like, this is all I have. This life is all I have. The next 50 years of what I choose to talk about and whom I choose to spend my time with and what activities I pursue and what philosophies I adhere to and things of this nature, like this is it. And that that time crunch really just overcame a lot of the fear that I would have had. And it was like, sorry, I will do everything I can to meet you in the middle and to hear your side. And I know how you think. So, you know, you have that going for you, but I, I do not believe this anymore. And, um, and uh, it was awful. And I think my wife handled it as best as anyone can handle it. Who still truly believes. I don't, I don't envy anyone in that situation. I know what that would have done to me just three years prior to me telling her. Right. And so I think, you know, I have a couple videos on my channel about how to come out and how to have these conversations. And I think the thing that so many of us miss 
is not understanding anymore. Just, just all of a sudden, well, I'm right. You're wrong. How foolish you believe come along with me. Like it was, it was never that it was, I, I get what this is doing to you. And I kind of gave her the, it wasn't an ultimatum, but it was like, I just upset our situation and our worldview. And I want you to take like as much time as you want to think about that and see if you still want to like do this thing with me. Um, kind of giving her, not that she needed my permission, but like uh, showing her my allowance of it as well of like, do you still want to be here? Do you still want to co-parent um, with this with this difference? And, you know, we kind of had to recommit ourselves in a non-Christian fashion to, okay, we want we want to do this together still. We, we don't want to cause this harm for our kids. You know, I came from divorce and I know what that does to kids. And I was like, this is not something I want for them, but if it's going to happen, it should happen now, not later and, and things of this nature. And, you know, luckily our love was strong enough to uh, not get in the way, but I understand how many people can't make that divide the, you know, she's probably not being as consistent as, you know, the Bible is telling her she needs to be if this situation were to arise. And um, so, yeah, that, it's been a struggle. I, I don't have any answers. You know, people have asked me like, how, sh what should I do? How should, how should I be raising the kids in a split home? My initial thoughts were, you know, cause my kids are six and four right now. They're at a Christian school. This is already stuff that got put in play before I deconverted. And also I didn't want to upset my wife's world too much. So I kind of caved on a few of the issues with the kids. I don't go to church. I don't read the Bible with them. I want to be consistent. So when they grow up and have questions and things of this nature, it was never, well, dad, why did you let me? Like, I want to be firm for me, but I don't want to overtake her either. And it's a, it's a horrendous balance to try to figure out as I'm sure you're aware of. And, um, and it's at the point now where it would just, I question which is going to be less beneficial for my kids, which is the, the, the lesser of two evils. Is it being the one person in their friend group, in their family, you know, all the in-laws they spend time with, all of the daycare providers are Christian, their school is Christian, their friends are Christian, their friends' parents are Christians. Is that going to be worse for them than the harm I think comes from religion? And I still don't really know the answer. I have some suspicions and my wife and I are having conversations every single day about how and when we're going to kind of tell them how daddy believes. Um and my son's getting there where we're going to have to have that conversation. He's very pragmatic. He has a lot of questions. I'm not going to lie to him if he asks me anything point blank. But I've encouraged her like, hey, if you're going to tell our kids this is real, you know, my goal here is not to deconvert you, but I need you to be looking at more than the same pretty passages in Luke before you put this on them. And so she's taken it upon herself to get a little more serious in her understanding of the Bible and the issues and contradictions that I've pointed out. I don't know where it'll end up. I, I view my wife as the kind of personality that I don't know if we'll ever leave the faith for a multitude of reasons. Um, and so if that is going to be an ongoing inconsistency between us, who knows how things are going to go with the kids. So that's where we're at right now. Like we are actively figuring it out. Hmm. That's a lot. It's it's such a heartbreaking dynamic, um, and I, I get it. It's it's hard on them. Um, I, if I could just give my two cents on it real quick, I do, I do take a different perspective. If and if you've seen some of my videos, you probably already know this, but I, I'm much more aggressive. I, I see it as this way. If if you I'll put it myself, say say my wife and I had married, and we were white supremacists, white nationalists. You know, whites are the only good people. Everyone else, you know, every other race sucks. And we wish, you know, Aryan stuff could come back. If that had been the case, and one of us wakes up and says, oh my gosh, like, what did I, what, what are we believing here? Like white supremacy is a horrible, you know, nasty, evil worldview. I'm done with that. I'm not, you know, I love other people and I love other races. I'm not going to believe that anymore. And, but your spouse is not, following you in that in that route now you have children well there's just there's too much at stake to not protect them the sense that they could be getting um you know the the indoctrination that would come and say you know i they're that they're on the track to become white supremacists if this doesn't get altered is fearful and as much as people would say well christianity and white supremacy are not the same thing in many no, ways because christianity is worse <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna say in many ways. Sorry to be snarky, but it is it's yeah. true. What's in what is 
the way people live out their Christianity, and this is the difference for me, and I'm not making excuses because I agree with you. Another, another, I really do agree with you. And another way that I heard it is how much poison would you let someone put in your kid's milk before you took the milk away? And I think that yes. that is another great way of like understanding that this isn't just a kindness and, but there is a reality to their particular watered down version of Christianity that my wife is kind of in, you know, um, I've labeled it like a Starbucks Christianity where it's more just about getting together with the girls and having coffee and telling each other, like, God's got you girl. And, you know, like yeah. it's still harmful. And it, th- if you're, if, if it's based off something that is incorrect, then I think it's harmful. And I think that some of the new atheists went too far and they didn't understand some aspects of not throwing everything out with the bathwater. But at the same time, I, I lean heavy to that side of like the Sam Harris of understanding that the irrationality, what it does cognitively to the brain to hold these beliefs at all sets one up for a great potential harm to say it at the very least. And so I agree. It's more of when is the right time? How is the right way? And not just jumping to making my kids air on my side. You know what I mean? And not that I, I, I don't believe my side is an error, but I can, yeah, obviously I still don't have it figured out because I, in my heart truly agree with you. Like this is something that they need to be saved from, but there's probably a better, more beneficial way to do it. And so that's what I'm looking for instead of just jumping at the first chance to like steer the train in a different track. Yeah. I, I agree a hundred percent. I think in some ways it's good for them to see it up close to say, you know, we, we weren't just, you know, atheist kids from day one or agnostic kids from day one. Like we actually saw it. We know what the message is. We know what you're saying. We, you know, we're not blind to the, to the gospel. We know the stories, but we just choose to reject them. And one of the things that I think has been really helpful for my situation, well, t- two things. Number one is to expose heavily the mythology of that's behind it all. And, you know, everything from, you know, Epic of Gilgamesh kind of stuff and other things from the Garden of Eden on, um, exposing a lot of stuff with the Book of Enoch and just so many aspects of that, especially in the New Testament with the Greco-Roman gods and the mystery cults, how they're copied and woven in, how Homeric epics are woven in. It's just like endless stuff that you can say, we didn't know this stuff as Christians, but now that we're out and are free to explore it, we're like, ah, oh, I see where they copied that story from, you know? For sure. And I give you quick examples, a lot of, you know, Dionysius turning water into wine. Of course, you know, Jesus does it. Um, the um, God Helios, he's a God, the sun God, he wears a purple robe and has the crown of the sun rays around his head. So a crown of thorns and Zeus cries tears of blood and water. What is Jesus doing? Gethsemane. And then uh, Hermes, you know, Flash, Hermes can walk on water with his golden slippers. So what does Jesus do? He walks on water over and over, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of times, they're copying the clear Greek gods. And I've, yep. I've loved telling my kids these stories. And I think that is a seed that will grow exponentially. The other big thing is just talking about the, the crazy, bizarre morality of it all, the psychopathic nature of the Yahweh character. And I just put it frankly, like, like God, I'm like, guys, if, if you were a dad, and you drowned your kids, are you a good dad or a bad dad? Like, it's real easy. This is not a hard question. Right. If you drown your kids, are you a good dad or a bad dad? And like, oh, of course it'd be a bad dad. I'm like, well, Yahweh drowns almost everybody. Like, what kind of dad is he? And, you know, he, 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 uh, you know, puts his kids in the garden with a horrible snake. What kind of God, you know, what kind of daddy would I be if I did that to you? And they get it. They really get it. Um, it's cool. How old are and, your kids? Uh, they range between three and eight. Okay. But um, and, and I, I do a lot more that's stealthy that I can talk about later. But there, there's just, and I'm doing a whole presentation I'm working on down later this year, hopefully about you know ways that I protect kids' minds. I have an older version of it, but I'm doing an update. But I think it'll help a lot of people who. But it, it's the thing is it's different too because some people are going to re- some Christians are going to respond to that and say, hell no, you can't say a word about anything. You know, if you say a word about it, we're divorced. You know, yesterday, and other people are going to say, well you know, let's have a fair, you know, you show, you share your worldview, I'll share mine, but let's make sure there's some equal airtime and then let the kids decide as they get older, which I think is appropriate. Um, even though I've, it, I feel like it's still psychological child abuse. I feel like you, you can't dominate to the point where you say, you know, they can only hear my 
worldview. That's you know, sure you're because both you parents. can't expect that from the other partner. Exactly. Like, yeah. and that is the balance you have to strike. And, and that's what I've told my wife. I was like, until this point, you know, it's been you. If you want to answer a question, you do so in whatever way you see fit. If I have to answer a question, I kind of have to deflect it. You know, if you want to take him to church, you take him to church. If I wanted to show him an atheist video, you're not cool with that. So like, we need to either get to the point where we raise them in a bubble of secularity for the first 25 years until their prefrontal cortex developed and everyone stops talking about everything. Or if you're going to have these influences and everyone, like 99% of their life is the Christian influence, at least I need to start being able to say my part. And she agrees. It is, it is again of That's good. when and how. So I, I think I have the best wife in the world for this. I, I know for a fact, my main closest circle of Christian friends that if any of them came out to their wife as an atheist, it equals divorce period and trying to keep them from the kids. It's, it's that, um, insane that I, I really feel like I, I got lucky because if that had been it, I probably would have had to deal with this in secret, watching my kids believe something horrendous. Um, yeah, who know? I don't know. I don't know how I would have done it because I'm at the same time, so unwilling to just corrupt their young life with their parents' issues and divorce issues and other things. So, you know, there's there's a time and place for everything. And I know you're dealing with some stuff too. So I'm not trying to say anything, but for me and figuring it out, it's at least been nice to have a wife that's like, I get it. Please just try to be as considerate as you can, as age appropriate as you can, and blah, blah, blah. And so we're we're figuring it out. We'll get there. But it's there's a the Bible got one thing right. Unequally yoked is not beneficial. So yeah, for sure. It's definitely a hard road. And it's hard too, because you want to wish not just for your kids a, a good life and a good worldview and less toxicity, but you just, you wish so much for your spouse to be able to see it. And you're just like, there's like, it's assuming the best that you, you, you all, you know, that spouses truly have some basic level of compatibility that you didn't, didn't just marry frivolously. And it's, it's a bad max to I me. Mean, it's a bad match otherwise, but if there's some level of compatibility, it's like, we like we can do okay as a married couple with different worldviews, but I know we could just fly if we were on the same. Page. Oh my gosh, I know. And they're just like, oh, I like I want you to see, but you know, in some ways, like they just if they're not ready, it's like that um, Matrix idea. Like some people are not ready to be unplugged, and if you try to, it's just going to blow up in your face. You sometimes just have to say, it, it, "This one's going to take some time. It maybe it will never happen." Um, but I think the the big thing too is to try to not punish each other for your differences. Cause that's one of the things that, you know, in my case is just it's on, it's on steroids, of course, as most people know who watch my channel, but like, if you can just have some sense of like, we have different worldviews, but you know what? Life is hard. We all need love. We all need affection. We all need partnership. We need someone to give us a hug and, a, you know, pat on the back and say, you're, you're doing okay. Just, you know, take it one day at a time. I love you as you are. Let's, we'll figure this out together just yep. some sense of camaraderie. And as long as there's not a thing of like, you know, if you do this, I'm, I'm going to get you bad for it. Once you introduce that, I'm going to get you for, for what you're doing, you know, mafia style, you know, low level tactics. It's like, uh, this, this isn't going, <laughs> this is going South quick. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's sad. I get a lot of comments from I, both sides. I get comments of people that are like, Oh, we love your channel. My wife and I just deconverted last year. And it's like, I can't imagine the glory of going through that with my wife. Like we're already so close. If we could see the same things in the same way, how mm. fantastic. And then I get the other comments of, you know, I had this one guy who started, even I, you know, I said, you know, email me. And then it turned into Voxer and he's, he wanted to start a channel. And so he's asking me some questions, but his wife said, if you do that, like I'm taking the kids, you know, it's one thing for you to do this, but they'll find out eventually and all of this other stuff. And, you know, he's not getting to live his life do the thing he believes he should be doing or speak the way he thinks he should be speaking at threat of harming his kids essentially in that way. And um, yeah, it's, it's just horrendous. So I'm at least glad to not be there, but I can't imagine how amazing it would be to, to be equally yoked on the other side too. So. Hmm, for sure. Well, I, I like to, um, as, as we head towards a wrap up, I do like to ask a question that I ask a lot. So sorry if this is redundant to my viewers, but uh, how did you deal with the loss of the afterlife? Did you want to live forever? Do you still want to live if you could have? How did you deal with all that? The fantastic question. I'm still figuring it out. I have moments of existential dread. Um, I don't want to live forever. I read a book called A Short Stay in Hell that helped me understand the concept of time. It's a fantastic book and it's a little novella. You should read it. 
And in this book, you really get a grasp. It's based off the um, the Borges short story, uh, The Library of Babel, which is all about the infinite complexities of, of time and, and numbers and really understanding deep time. And going through just a few thought experiments in that regard has shown me that infinity of any kind is pure torture. There is there is nothing that should go on forever. So, you know, even the idea of heaven, it, again, to talk about the new atheist and people like Hitch who would just blatantly say, oh, I'd rather party in hell. It's like, if you had the choice, you would be so foolish not to choose heaven over hell. We can make all the funny Christian quips about, I wouldn't want to be with those Christians. I wouldn't want to be with that God. If it's really real, if those two things really exist, of course you'd want to be in heaven. But despite that, I still think heaven sounds absolutely awful. And and yes, we can imagine that an all-powerful God would find a way for heaven to be not awful. But I think infinity is a dumb concept for human brains to want to be in. Um, so that aside, there's some relief. There's other questions though, because I also am not, you know, I'm very agnostic with many of my other beliefs. There's so much I don't know and that I don't think we can know that I'm not one of those atheists who went straight to, oh, then there's just oblivion. Who knows? I don't, I don't know. Does, is there some kind of eternal recurrence where I'm going to show up 10 billion years later on some other planet as some other species because the particles arrange? I might not have a memory, but there might be some form of me still exist. You know, I don't know. I don't know if we're in a simulation. I don't know if I'm a brain in a vat. There's so many things we just don't know. And so there is still that tiny fear of death of what if there is something worse after this? Um, and you, whether it is oblivion that you don't want because I'd love another hundred years or I'd love to be with my kids longer, or whether it is um, missing out on what you once thought heaven was really like, there is still a, a sadness to dealing with the idea that I don't know what happens after death. I can't know what happens after death. It's definitely not what I used to think it was. And that's just not a fun place to be. So yeah, I have um, a lot of happy belief that I'm no longer ever going to be up for any kind of thing that is considered the biblical hell. That's great. Some existential dread, some sadness to lose out on the idea of being with my kids forever in a perfect place. Um, and that's hard. So from a philosophical standpoint, as I've kind of tried to develop my own personal philosophy with how do I want to live my life? And if there is no objective morality from a creator being like, where am I getting my ethics from? Um, I've really enjoyed that. I've always been a deep reader. I I actually can't believe it took me 30 years to deconvert considering all of the things I read. I mean, I read the great classics and philosophical works between high school and 30, and I just how did I miss it? You know, there was such a strong bias from my Christian perspective that I could see those thoughts, see those ideas, enjoy the beauty of them and still completely dismiss them as, as anything useful or accurate or truthful. So now mm -hmm. I get to go back to all of those thoughts and all of those readings and all of those ideas and start developing for myself um, what I think is important and where I've landed. And, and if I were going to try to wrap it up, I would say I now have the understanding, the correct understanding that whatever is after death Life is absolutely temporary. That we know. It is finite. This body, this conscious experience, this time with my children, this time with my wife, this time with my friends will indeed end. And that is the greatest freedom to enjoy now, to be present, to figure out how to be beneficial to myself and to others, to alleviate suffering for other people that uh, are not as lucky as I am to be born the way that I am with the brain that I have and the experiences that I've had to lead me to this, et cetera. And so I think it's absolutely gorgeous, which is again, why I just am so sad. I can't do it with my wife. Like how much more present could we be together in these moments with our children instead of trading it? It's a trade. You make an absolute trade. It's in the nature of the gospel message, storing up treasures tomorrow, not worrying about today, leave your family. All of it is horrendous. And it's the opposite of enjoying and taking care and being precious with the time that we have. So all of that became extremely beautiful, but the death thing is still a bummer because if all that is beautiful, another hundred years would be great. Another 500 years, maybe anything after that, who, who knows? Um, but I'm fine in the abstract, generally speaking, and it has made uh, my time here much more precious and important and allowed me to take better action. Hmm. Well said, well said. I love that. Well, very well said. I'm, I'm amazed at the perspectives that we like just, it feels like in some ways when you deconvert, I could say this about a lot of little sections of, of philosophy, but just, it just feels like you kind of regain your humanity hmm. and you regain a, a, a maturity that just wasn't there and a sense of, of putting things in perspective and balance 
And I, I definitely hear that coming through and I love it. And one of the things that what you said, not directly, but indirectly made me think is I wish so much that people are loved ones who are still in it, uh, in Christianity. I wish that they could see that we're truly trying to pursue the truth. Like it isn't this whole thing of, you know, you just want to sin, you know, of course the big one, but you know, you really know that there's a God and you really know it's Yahweh. You just want to suppress it. Like, no, no, like, I don't really want to sin. I don't know that there's a God and I definitely don't know that it's Yahweh. Um, but I really am just pursuing the truth. I'm not trying to do this so I can go have affairs. I'm not trying to do this so I can do something immoral. I truly don't think that this stuff adds up. Like I just, it just doesn't make sense to me. And you'd, you'd hope that Christians would in some level have a, a, a maturity and a respect to say, you know what? I wouldn't want you to believe it just, just to give verbal assent. Like I want you to really believe it. And if you don't, if this, if this doesn't add up to you, if this, if, if this looks like I'm trying to tell you to say two and two equals seven, and you know it is under no circumstances is two and two can equal seven. But that's what you think we as Christians are kind of saying that this just doesn't add up. I don't want you to repeat the mantra two and two equals seven until you're sure you believe that it's it's actually accurate of reality. And for them to just say, you know, bless you on your journey. I hope you, I, you know, I want you to pursue the truth like you're saying. And I respect that you're actually honestly doing that. You really are pursuing the truth. You're not making this up. You don't have a hidden agenda. You it, it just, it you can't believe what doesn't make sense. And you, in many ways, once you start researching, you can't unsee what you've seen. For sure. And I would love for that to be the dynamic. I know it's not for for almost all of us that that I talk to about it, but you just, you'd wish that there was some sense of people saying, if you're telling me that what you want most in this world is to pursue the truth and to find it if, to whatever extent you can, then I'm, I'm going to be your, your, in your cheerleading section, pursue the truth. If it leads you to Christianity, then great. If it doesn't, keep pursuing the truth. I, I, when I, I said that actually to uh, a loved one, when I was just, I was not deconverting yet. I was just thinking through some of these issues. I said, just so you know, I just, I don't know where this is leading, but I'm, I just, I really want to pursue the truth no matter where it leads me, no matter what it does to my worldview. And I mean, Christians looked at me and they were like horrified. Like, oh yeah, you're the, what are devil. you saying? Yeah. Yeah. That's the, that I think is actually maybe one of the biggest byproducts or, or in, internal harms of religion, whatever it is, but specifically Christianity. How many Christians would love to say that? They want to say that. They might even feel that. But in the back of their nagging mind is, but I don't really wish that for you because two things. One, that could mean that this is all not true, which affects me now. So you're affecting me with your lack of belief. Or two, I do care about you and I would wish those things for you, but not more than I would wish you not burning in hell, not more than I would wish you, you know, missing out on heaven. And, and it's like, it's filled with so many layers of backup excuses that even the best Christians with the best of intentions and the biggest hearts, because of course, Christians can still be wonderful people despite their horrendous beliefs, which sounds a little ironic at this point, but they can't always act out of those good intentions because their hierarchy of truth is just different and it's baked into it. It's it's really sad. And that would be the healthy Christian, right? The Christian that just wants to talk about the gospel message. They have a, a personal relationship with Jesus. They want that for you. They want you to avoid hell. Like that's not all this like old, the Canaanites were right. We should be sacrificing our firstborn. Like that's just like the healthy version of Christianity. And it's almost more harmful to deny truth in that regard because of this messed up hierarchy of belief systems and values. So I hear you, man. It's, um, it's just, it is just sad. Hmm. A few quick questions and I'll, I'll let you go. Yeah. Um, one question that I have was, do you feel at all either, you know, directly that you've got this message or just the sense that Christians either want you to fail in life or that they expect you to fail in life just as a way of God either getting you, you know, it's hard to, as Paul, Paul talks about in, in, in our Luke and Acts, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. Like you can't, you can't kick a cactus and win. Um, you know, you're fighting God and God's, God is going to, you know, he's going to win one way or the other. Like you're going to bow your knee gladly, or you're going to bow your knee, you know, sadly, but you're going to bow your knee at some point to the Lord. Um, you're going to repent uh, one way or the other. 
um, either getting you to heaven or getting you to hell, but your your life is going to go bad. You have left the light of, of, of life, Jesus and the gospel and the Bible. There's nothing left for you but darkness. Either we want you to fail so we can kind of say, ha ha, you know, look, look where your stupid atheism got you. Or just to say, you know, we're, we're sorry that you're going to fail, but God is going to punish you. you. You know, James is clear. You will sow what you've reaped. You have sown walking away from, from the Bible. You are going to reap what that is, which is, you know, God is very clear. I will bless those who are obedient to me and I will curse those who are not. God, you're kind of under God's curse and you did it to yourself. So, you know, either we were glad, you know, yay, God's going to win today and he's going to get you or just we're heartbroken, but he is, he is going to win and you're going to fail. You're going to fall flat on your face. Do you feel like people are kind of doing this imprecatory prayer about you? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And I want to be careful not to paint with too broad a brush in answering it. I've seen um, a, a vast spectrum of, of Christian reaction in between those two camps. And, you know, you have the very vocal ones that I'm sure you get in your comment section. And I get in my comment section that are like, enjoy hell, buddy. And it's like, there's this there's this vindication to them for being on the right side. And you have others that I think, you know, that's like an unhealthy thing. It's all unhealthy in general. But then there's the Christian that is, um, you know what? Like, I side with God's righteousness. And God's righteousness sees that you deserve hell. So even though that might make my my physical heart sad, my spiritual heart is going to be rejoicing in heaven for God's justice. And it's like, that's sick. That's disgusting. I've had a lot of people kind of explain that to me that like, mm. you know, we question sometimes, well, how is heaven going to be good if people know that the loved ones in their life is bad? Because when you go to heaven and you're in God's glory and you're in his seat of justice, you will be happy that your son who disbelieved is burning in hell because it will be God's justice enacted. It's like, how how warped do you have to be? And then there's other people who I think it, it comes down to a basis of what they actually believe the scriptures say about this life. There's two Christian views that uh, things will get progressively worse and Satan will get more dominance until, you know, the the rapture and the second coming and things of this nature. And so me, I'm going to win now that I'm an atheist. I'm I'm on the earthly team that wins the battle and loses the war. So they don't see me getting my comeuppance or my destruction until I die or until the rapture happens. And then there are those that are like, hey, you're outside of God's blessing. You know, this this would be like my mom as an example. Like, not only am I terrified for your eternal soul, I'm terrified for how this is going to affect your family and the sin that you're going to bring into them and all of these other things. And all of it, all of those, and every iteration in between in the entire spectrum is some people doing the best they can and some people just being narcissistic. But either way, you can't have a healthy response to truth when your basis is incorrect, incorrectness. Like it's, it just sucks. I don't blame any of them for any of those reactions because they're all just going with what they believe or what they've read. And some people are more pedantic and petty and that might come down to a personal issue. But um, in general, I just feel actually sorry for them that, that they are so special so narcissistic in their thinking, even if they're good people, that their way is the only way, that they found the one true God, that they found the one correct version of the Bible, that they got the right interpretation and they went to the right church, that they know this thing that is so unknowable. Um, how anyone can think that that is the case. Even if you're a Christian, you believe, just admit, like there's a lot of denominations. I might have something wrong, but this is what I believe and here's why. And I'm crossing my fingers. Like that's really as, as truthful as you can be. So I don't know if I answered your question at all, but those were the the thoughts that came up from it. Yeah, absolutely. Curious, this is a quick question. Do you do you ever get the sense that any Christians you talk to are willing to admit or or just just track with you on some level the bizarreness of the Christian worldview? And it's a couple of big levels. Um, whether you're talking about the psychopathic nature of of the Yahweh character, um, the bizarre preachments of the Old Testament, you know, with stoning and child brides and all that. And, and beating your slaves till they're almost dead. But even going beyond it to what we do current day, like when you look at the Lord's table, you'd say we are, even if you're not, you know, Catholic, we're at transubstantiation, just we're, we're symbolically looking at this, but you're still pretending to eat a dead man's body, drink a dead man's blood. That's really freaking weird. And I know when I was in it, I did not see it as weird, but like, and I love talking with my kids like, yeah, this is really weird, daddy. For sure. But do you think there's any Christians who would be willing, or, or even just the salvation issue to say, 
you have a God who says, I cannot forgive you without blood. Like, well, why not? Don't you make the rules? Can't you just say, I forgive you? Like, do you have anybody who, who you've come across who's willing to say, especially loved ones in your inner circle, who would say, yeah, what I believe is kind of weird, but it's still true. And that almost proves it, you know, because you wouldn't come up with this stuff. It does seem kind of weird, but that's the stumbling block aspect mm -hmm. of this. It's supposed to make you cringe a little bit that God is different. He's other. He's got a different rule book. But no, you know, but I see what you mean. It is kind of weird. Do you have anyone who's been willing to admit some of those things? I don't know if this is going to ring true for you, but my experience with that was yes, before I came out as an atheist. I used to be able to have conversations with my friends, my still extremely religious fundamentalist friends about like, do you think there's like a God's God? You know, and we'd have these like fun conversations. Like, do you think there's a bigger God that made God or like blood magic is kind of weird, right? Like we'd, we'd believe and like, yeah, that's something that I wouldn't have got to for a long time. And then I kind of got there and, and it's like, as long as your friends think this was my experience, we're not going to be dumb enough to become atheists. Then we can just enjoy the questioning. Yeah. It's not quite blasphemous. It's just this fun pondering or poking fun out a little bit. I mean, I, I definitely remember specific conversations with my friends where they would make fun of like uh, Scientology or Mormonism because of, you know, Xenon doing this or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And I'd be like, you understand like the, like, you understand, like if we just say Genesis without all the pretty words, like this is insanity. Like the talking snake talked to the naked woman that convinced the first man whose son found a wife from another tribe, even though they were the first two people on earth. Like, you know, you go through the whole thing about just how insane it is. And it's like, oh, yeah, that sounds kind of silly. But the second everyone knew I was an atheist, if I tried to say anything, even like way more like dialed in than that, it was like heresy, right? They, they could no longer allow themselves, at least with me to show any weakness, to agree on any point of doubt, because look what it did to me. I think I was a, a cautionary tale. I was like the first person that I know of in my entire like, like huge group that ever took the dive completely away from religion. And so I think it shocked mm -hmm. everyone so much that everyone closed up about those subjects with me completely, or they did the opposite and shoved down my throat. The excuse is like, oh, I heard you had an issue with slavery. Well, actually here, here, and it's like, you know, you're so wrong. You're so wrong. Let me go make a video about it. You're so wrong. That's how much I have to say about it. But um, yeah, I, I had a lot of those before. And that's what's that's what's really interesting to me to think about the Christian belief again and kind of that that measure I mentioned before is obviously these people had these thoughts and they're okay with having these doubts even um, to some degree. And people would always tell me when I started questioning, if I let them in, oh, it's good. Yep, this is good. This testing period is good. God wants you to doubt. You, you should. A healthy Christian should doubt. And then the second you're like, oh, I doubted so much I don't believe anymore. They're like, oh, now you've messed up. It's like, you didn't really want me to doubt. You wanted me to doubt and then come back stronger so I could have a better testimony. And so I, th I think mm. you see a lot of the insincerity that people have um, once you once you make the final crossover. Yeah, well said. I think too, I'll just add one thing that I, I heard a lot was that verse, I forget where it is in the Corinthians, I think about the natural man cannot receive the things of the spirit mm. of God. They're spiritually discerned. And the idea that if you're truly an atheist and in their minds for a lot of them they'll say then that means you never were a christian so you right. never really have the spirit yep. then that means that you truly do not have the capability at all to accurately divide the word of truth you cannot understand it and basically your any opinion you have at this point is effectively null and void because totally. you're just you have a dark mind yeah and there's there's no way to redeem this there's no way for you to see it correctly it's like someone who's who's um you know desperately needs glasses you know like those real thick glasses that are really like you can barely see through them from an outsider's perspective. And and you're like, wow, you're like, your vision's really off. Well, it's like, okay, like that's, that's how bad it is. Like your vision is that bad that without those, you know, glasses, there's, you can't see anything. You're just like, where am I? You know, I can't see the walls. And they're like, that's, that's basically where you're at. And so for yeah. you to start talking about theology and, and uh, the Bible, it's like, yeah, your, your opinion doesn't matter anymore. And it makes sense almost from like a stranger's perspective. Like I get those kinds of comments all the time and it's like, dude, I live this more than the average person for 30 years. I've got the Bible major. Like I'm not just holding credentials over your head, but like, I know this, I, I know this stuff like you knew it. And I felt it like you felt it. And I can understand how they can't, you know, they don't know me personally. And I, and they take those verses very literally, but my friends 
who would come to me when they had biblical confusion because I was the one that like really knew this stuff and they relied and trusted me to give me the exact same the exact same treatment of oh well you can't understand this stuff you don't believe in god it's like you knew me for 30 years when i believed with the faith of a child far too long and when i knew the bible better than you and now all of a sudden you have the upper hand here with interpreting scripture like you're just still making excuses and i've come to the realization that it wasn't worth making excuses for and that they don't work and we can disagree but to say to try to take my sincerity away or my knowledge away because it doesn't fit in with your worldview, this is a new problem, right? So, yeah. yeah very disrespectful. I did want to wrap up by just asking if you could to give a plug for your channel, both what you've done so far and also oh, sure. maybe what your, what's on your radar. You know, what can we expect from it going forward? And just, um, you know, what what would be the, the main uh, thing that people could hopefully benefit from as they get connected with your channel? Yeah, appreciate that. Uh, you know, the goal of the channel, Mind Shift in general, was just follow the truth wherever it leads. That was it, you know, that I might still not know where the truth is and I'm going to be on my journey and come along with me. Um, specifically, it ended up more counter apologetics than I intended it to. I've got a, a few different series that we're going through. I'm doing a secular Bible study where I spend about 30 to 40 minutes going through each book of the Bible from an objective truth. That's really interesting. I'm on uh, Judges nice. right now. This Thursday will be Judges. So we've done six. Oh, fun. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's 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 a blast to actually go through the Bible with the lenses removed. And the comments have been really encouraging about how helpful this is. And by making it more secular, and you know, I initially labeled it unholy, like I changed it to secular. I've had a lot of Christians come in and like interact with it, and like, oh, I, I, I didn't know that. I never looked at that before. And so, I think that there's some outreach there that's um, beneficial. The rest of it is a lot of deconversion help, how to come out, how to talk to loved ones, um, sharing my deconversion story, uh, what to do, how to develop a personal philosophy, and things of that nature. And then the rest of it is just uh, counter apologetics fully, which I know you. You know, I watched on one of your videos where you were explaining your goal of your channel is we've moved past it. Like we know, like, let's talk about how to live a, a good life. Um, I'm still, uh, and I totally respect that. I'm still interested in dealing with the arguments, even though they've been dealt with a hundred times. If people are going to keep making them, I want to keep talking about them. I want equal representation. So whether it's reacting to John MacArthur or Mike Winger or inspiring philosophy or whatever, um, I do a lot of reaction videos trying to give the experience that I had as a Christian um, a healthy experience and understanding of where they're coming from with the truth of what the Bible actually says. And if it does say that, what it would mean about that God and how we can reconcile that or not reconcile that with uh, the concepts in our life. So that's it in a nutshell. Hopefully people find it interesting and yeah, I'd love for people to come take a look. Mm, that's awesome. I love it. I love it. Yeah. And I feel like in some ways, you know, different, all the different platforms, you know, yours, uh, Myth Vision and a lot of others that are doing great work. Um, just we all kind of have our little niche that hopefully people can kind of pick and choose what's going to really help them for where they're at. And, you know, I feel like mine is is obviously more de deconversion stories at the moment, as well as, you know, healing from religious trauma. Yeah. But, uh, you know, everybody's got a different part of their journey. And, you know, hopefully it just blends together where people can see the great work you're doing. And, you know, one day like your your video would just, bam, that's exactly what I needed to work on today and think through. And, you know, mine hopefully, you know, uh, hits a need the next day. Hopefully, you know, between all of our channels doing the great work that we're doing and the community building, people just feel like they've really got the resources to not feel alone. And I feel like that's one of the biggest things that's been a, uh, just a huge benefit to me is realizing there is a community out there. It takes a while to get plugged in, yeah. but there is a community. There's people that care about you and they don't want you to feel alone in this journey. And just to know that you can you can get help, you can get information. And eventually um, you can hopefully for some people when the time's right, you can actually create your own platform and you know raise your voice a little bit. And you know, be be transforming from I'm healing and I'm I'm regrounding myself to I'm actually ready to go. You know, help other people who are going through the same thing because you know there's so many things that we've talked about that we could dig deep into that other people are they haven't even thought about them yet. They're going to think about them a year from now, and it's going to hit them like a ton of bricks. Like, oh my gosh, like what have I just discovered? And all the stuff that we're you know years into for them, it's day one. And yeah. so they're going to need a lot of, a lot of help, a lot of encouragement. So, yeah. And that's what I love about your channel. So, you know, I'll take this time uh, before we end to just say, thanks, man. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed your deep conversion stories and hearing it's made me think about things from a different angle, hearing other people's perspectives and where they came from and people that are recently deconverting to remember, like, that's what they're going through. That's what they're thinking. And people that have been out of it for 20 years and you hear like, look at the peace they have in their life. Like they've, they've done the hard work, they've gone through it. So I think 
it's a fantastic platform just to allow people to share all of the different experiences that have the same common denominator of seeking truth and dealing with the consequences of that. And yeah, I just, I love it, man. So well done and thank you. And thanks for having me on. Hmm. Thank you so much for saying that. Yeah, it's definitely a privilege, privilege and an honor to be, uh, you know, the host of the platform. And I, I love it. And I definitely appreciate everyone that's been a part of it, both in terms of the interviewees, you know, past and, and future and, and so forth, but also just the community of people. Some people are not ready to interview, but just so many people saying this, this is what we need. Keep it up, keep up the good work. And I, I love it. It's, it's, it is definitely a privilege and an honor. So thank you for those kind words. Well, I'll just wrap up by saying again, we've been speaking with Brandon uh, of MindShift. Again, I'll have the link beneath the video. Please, uh, as soon as you can, go like and subscribe and check out his great stuff. Brandon, awesome to hear your story. Thank you so much for your uh, sharing your story today. Yep. Thanks for having me. Cheers, thank Tim. You.